Lawrence wanted to do the dough thing? I did the mushroom. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> the calm before the storm. Yeah. Step down and stretch a little bit, and then I'll do my pepper. Very good. Okay, then just let me know what I'm doing. So, um, Ted is a kind of this. Do your thing, and I think you know about all the crazy people you've heard that. I do, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I don't care, I'm too ugly, it doesn't matter. <laughs> too good. Yeah, too good. Yeah. Yeah, so okay. it's more interesting. I'm not gonna let Ted talk then. Okay. <laughs> no, no, sit down, sit down, sit down, Ted. Yeah. Yeah, it's the eleven. No, good, good to know. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Ted'll do Ted stuff. Okay. Excellent. I think we're ready to start. That guy's not working. So welcome to DNS Hop, the first session. It's the thing in front of here is not working, but we can sort of fudge it. So I can look. Oh, that's what I'll do. So I am Tim. That is Suzanne. Warren is our AD over there. Um, Paul will be taking minutes. Paul Hoffman, raise his hand. We do have a Jabber scribe, and whose name um, does sort of fails me at this moment. So, um, or if you do want to volunteer, please raise your hand and get our love and affection. Yep. He's Reboot. Yep. We're turn it off. We're turn the monitor off and on again. This is the dean. That's why we do things. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> so, so thank you, Paul, for doing the minutes. Um, this is the new improved note well. Whoa. Um, this is Tuesday, so we should all have the new text sort of memorized by now. So, and I actually put links into all the BCPs. So there are blue sheets floating around, and we, yep. So please fill them in. Um, it's always interesting to see who shows up. I like to read later and find out who actually appeared and who didn't. So we've got some agenda bashing. Mr. Lawrence wants to talk for a little bit, some updates, some working group business, some new stuff. And of course, a special guest at the end because I always love a little crazy going on. So David, do you wanna do your little thing about dough? So David Lawrence is one of the co-chairs of the DNS over HTTPS because everything's gonna be over HTTPS in the next, you know, if it's not already. NTP over HTTPS. Um, uh, <laughs> so I just wanted to bring to your attention that the one single document that the DNS over HTTPS working group has been working on is trending towards being wrapped up and we're probably gonna end up moving it to last call after this meeting. Uh, that's a discussion we're having in Doe, but uh, since many interested people are likely in this room as well and might not have been aware how close that was to getting finalized, you might want to show up at the working group meeting, which is Thursday session one, Thursday afternoon session one, uh, 
to uh, if you have some input on that document. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Dave. And if you're worried about us getting out of here on time, um, my better half is here and we're going to the social, so I know we will be out of here at, on time. So uh, if you feel like the Campbell presentation is going to take us all off the rails, fear not. You know, At least Suzanne and myself and Paul will all leave it at the proper time. So, um, so, so a bunch of stuff. We've got a bunch of documents floating around. Um, the 5011 one, we've been sort of beating back and forth. There is some serious rough consensus on this. Wes has promised to do the... Um, a, there's just some updates from Victor's comments, and we have some, some I know, some very strong um, negative comments from Mr. St. John that if we do move it forward, it's all going to end up in the Shepherd's notes, and it's all going to end up in the ISG pile to sort of let them sort of sort it out. So, because I trust them to sort of do the right thing there. Um, Lee Howard, finally, we finally sorted out our IP6, so we're going to actually kick off this working group list call. I was going to say after this meeting, but it'll probably be tomorrow morning after the social. So, and we'll do a one week because the most of the comments were non-normative. So it's just updates and we'll get that thing out. Joe finally appeared out of nowhere and with updates for the refuse any draft. And he will be talking later about that. And then as long as everything's been addressed, we will be kicking off a one week working group class called just to address those last little bits of issues. Joe, raise your hand so I know you're actually still here. Okay, you didn't disappear on us again. Okay, thank you. And the all TLD draft, I don't, I'm just. <laughs> so <laughs> can I, I leave can it Can I help back, you out okay? here? Can okay. I, can yes, I help you out you here? can speak. This was actually one of the things that we had hoped to have off the docket by now, but the plan is what it is the same as it was, which is to, now that people have had a rest from related topics, we got the problem statement, special use names document out late last year, and people have had a worked example of an IETF working group that needed a special use name with home.arpa. Um, we're going to, now that people have had a rest, we're going to um, bring this forward again and see um, if there's consensus to move it forward. We did a last call earlier that didn't get a lot of informed commentary. We would like to see a little bit more. So we gave people a, a, a break from the entire topic, and now we're going to try and see again what the, the sentiment in the working group really is. This chair would just sort of like to make it all sort of vanish. So let's please move that document out of here, and then one that'll- One way or the other. One way or the other, and <laughs> you'll just make me a happy person. So, um, Shes and Shigling has been a working group last call, and Stuart's gonna talk about the updates that have sort of been addressed, that have come up during that. You're, um, and the local host one, which we kind of went through the, not right now, sit back down. Um, sorry, Stuart. Um, we're waiting for Mike West to sort of make some comments. The, the last call's over and he's promised to address some stuff and ran into some issues. So we're slowly waiting to see what we can find out from him, what's going on there. Um, some of these are actually gonna be talked about this afternoon, but these are basically up on the, in the, in the sort of the working group last call thing, the DNS capture format, which, there's one or two issues that they're going to talk about that are sort of open, but I believe that's once those get addressed, working the last call on that. The KSK role, I believe they've addressed everything, and I think that looks like it's um, once we sort of go through it in the meeting here, we'll be in a similar state there. And Paul's making slow, steady progress on the terminology biz, and I've been seeing lots of, there's lots of great discussion on the mailing list about the split horizon and all sorts of other excellent esoteric names but we're sort of shooting for mid-April, if all goes well. So um, we finally found Dave Crocker. So Dave, thank you for showing up. And he published the new ad relief draft and it looks like we're splitting it into two different documents. So he's got the first one in there and we're gonna get the application guys to look at it. And if it looks good, that's ready to move forward. I'm pretty happy about that. Um, I think Peter is talking about the, no, Evan is. Um, there is some discussion, and you'll see this in the in, in his talk about wanting to some ideas about where to move forward on that. I'd like to move forward on a name, um, but I know there's some outstanding issues that the working group has to address. Extended error. I think it's ready. I, there's one. I believe the authors owe us one update. Okay, Mr. Lawrence is going to get up and apologize. I'm sorry. Um, 
Yeah, so uh, we do owe you an update. Uh, I have an edit in flight, and then Wes is going to pick up the editing pen, and maybe we'll actually get it pushed out uh, tomorrow before Thursday's meeting. Um, I, to the extent, um, sure, the authors would love to hear that it's ready for working group last call, but I think you should probably wait till you see the edits before you make that. I, I think if there's no other, because the it's, it's mostly just adding m more possible responses. Yep. So um, yep. in that sense, it probably is ready. But Yes. So. Now the server stale one, I like it. Other people just are appalled by it. Um, you know that's usually how uh, things go I'm, in this world. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> and so hi, I'm back. Yes, you're back. Um, I know. Uh, so uh, Paul Vixie brings up a number of interesting points on the list that, given kind of the craziness that's gone on in my life over the past couple of months, I was not able to address yet. I do intend to respond to that. I would say that there is indeed, uh, just from the feedback that I get, quite a lot of support for the idea and a number of different implementations that do some variation on that anyway to you know, to, that it's still worth recognizing that this is, in fact, a resiliency mechanism that many people are using on the net and therefore will likely be uh, still something that we're going to want to tackle in the working group. Yeah. But I do owe Paul a response. Where it is, you have a little bit more spare time right now. So for <laughs> Surprise better or for vacation. <laughs> so, and on the TCP requirements, Dwayne and John actually are going to put together an update in the next week or so. Um, there's some to do's in there, but once they do, I would, we're going to push some stuff to list and help to get some folks to help us fill out some of the sections in there. Um, thank you, Francis, for submitting the, finally, the 20, 2845 biz. We're actually going to kick off a working, um, a call for adoption. Well, probably not tonight because we're going to the social, but probably tomorrow. And I believe that's going to be easily adopted because we're very much, we we're going to do that after Singapore, but then we lost you. So it's okay. That happens. So. We've got a big list of documents that we're working on and stuff that's sort of coming in and out of the group, as you can see, because you'll see that on Thursdays, which is all sort of the sort of the rough and tumble world of the world. But what we've realized is um, I used to work with a many years ago at Silicon Graphics, my one of the colonel guys, I mean, one of the colonel guys, this guy, John, the Scottish guy, would always say, we have a crisis of success. There's, we're doing too good, right? So we've got too many documents, too much stuff coming through the group. So, and a lot of stuff wanting to line up for adoption, and we're sort of keeping busy trying to track all this stuff down. Stuff is sort of occasionally falling through the cracks. Um, and Paul's keeping us, you know, finding stuff like, oh, you know, Mr. Waters forgot to update, you know, the, but that's okay, you know. Um, so we could actually probably use an extra set of hands. So if you're interested, contact our AD. And Warren, Warren, may, have a word and Warren may have a word about this. So he's been eager to get to the mic. <laughs> so yeah, um, as folks can see, we have a lot of moving documents. Um, 14 is a lot to keep running. Um, and sort of different working groups have fairly different personalities. Um, DNS Ops seems to be very good at getting excited about starting documents and adopting documents. But you know, as authors, we're not always that good about getting documents finally finished and out the door. So um, DNS up seems to need more than most working groups in terms of sort of poking authors and being like, you owe us an update, you owe us an update, you owe us an update. So to sort of help spread that load a bit, um, you know, we're looking for volunteers for, for a third chair. If you're interested or willing, um, you know, please send me email directly and maybe we can help spread the load slightly because people have day jobs, et cetera. Thanks. So I would, it, sometimes it's weird because we say this and then of course, Bert's gonna come up. Bert, I hope you're here. Um, and um, he's going to tell us that we're actually doing too much stuff. So, um, <laughs> uh, so here's our kind of rundown on stuff going on. Um, that's our new stuff. Or here's the new stuff. Um, and of course, Bert's a special guest. Bert, raise your hand. I don't see you out there. Um, oh, there you are. No, you're speaking for. Oh, my slacker. Um, okay. So that's probably better. So I figure that's interesting because, um, as you know, John Clinton published 8324 recently in the independent stream, and it talks about similar stuff, but from a standards point of view. And Bert's coming from a very operational point of view, like as folks who have to build this stuff and deploy this stuff, which, hey, that's us, DNS Op. Um, this is the stuff I think about you know, in my day job. Are we sort of putting too many pieces together, and which pieces do we, do we deploy versus not deploy? So. I figure Bert will be highly entertaining 
if not anything else. So, um, so moving forward, Paul, I think you're going to talk about, let's get you to talk about um, terminology biz real quick. Um, mostly folks are paying attention. I'm very happy about that. We're very happy about that. I think Paul's happy for the most part about that. So I'm going to stand down here because I actually have no slide. Um, thank you for the people who are participating on terminology BIS. Um, thank you for the people who are disagreeing with the current text um, because, in fact, the disagreements have actually brought out additional terms and new things and such like that. Um, we're getting close towards working group last call, as Tim said earlier. We still have two or three more terms that people had pointed out um, to Andrew and Kazanori and I as uh, possibly problematic. And you've noticed that I, on Monday mornings, have been say, throwing out a term and then the conversation is very, very active and usually dies out within a week or so. Um, I think I still have two more terms on my list of possibly problematical ones. We'll do a new draft and then um, I think it's okay if this is a contentious working group last call, that is with lots of comments. If people don't think that, let me know and then we might do just sort of another round of staring at it. But I think that this is probably an okay time for us to try to close it out. And I don't mean close it out as in we're done, but then to, you know, people, people in this room especially do tend to all of a sudden pay attention during working group last call. And I, I believe it'll be a long working group last call, but then I think we will be really done. That's a good point. Thank you. Yeah. So what I didn't put on here that if Bert actually gets done, oh, Mr. Sullivan. Uh, hi, Andrew Sullivan. Oh. Um, uh, just uh, to follow up on that, there, there is one thing that I would like people to think about before that last call happens, and that is, does this document, you know, is there a future for this or is there a different form for it? This kind of this kind of thing, right, that, that's a taxonomy or a doc, uh, um, what do you call that? See, I, I don't have words anymore. The, the wordy thing that tells you what, a word, what the words mean, um, it, it can sometimes be better as a wiki or something like that. And I'm just wondering if people could think about that. Thanks. Yep. And, and while 7719 was informational, this will be standard track as well. So um, pay attention, folks. Um, and actually, what I what I forgot to put at the bottom that if Bert gets done talking in time, his oh there he is, hi Bert, thank you for showing up. Um, his employee Peter will talk about the XPF stuff that him and um, Ray Bellison are working on, but Peter's not holding out hope for that. So <laughs> anyway, Stuart is up next, and we'll cover some sort of the working group stuff. So any other comments about agenda stuff going on, what we're up to, etc. So we're here. Warren's there. You know where to find us. We're not hard to find. I'm not hard to find, actually. So, okay. Okay, so um, I'm hoping we can help with your backlog of documents by getting one of them published. This is a status update. Uh, just to remind people of some of the history here, uh, in the DNSSD working group, we wrote the draft for push notifications back in 2015, and uh, Ray Bellis looked at that, and I think rightly said, you're mixing up general session management information here with the specific push notification mechanism. And he argued for separating that into two documents, which I think was good advice. Uh, it did slow things down a little bit. Now, the good news is I think we end up with something better as a result of that. Uh, uh, the session signaling draft went through uh, about a year of work there. And last September, uh, with discussion of the authors, we realized that it was about more than just session signaling. It was really a foundation for supporting stateful operations. So that led to the name change. So getting up to the recent status update, uh, we submitted draft 04 uh, last September, which was what we felt was finished. We had some good discussion on that. Uh, 
We decided to remove the requirement that every request is paired with a response, and we introduced the concept of unacknowledged messages. And that was discussed very well in Singapore, and we updated the document as a result of that and started the working group last call. That working group last call happened last month. Uh, we got some bunch of good feedback that result in lots of textual changes to the document. If you run RFC diff, you'll see lots of red and green, uh, but nothing substantive about the uh, over-the-wire protocol. So I think we clarified some things that were ambiguous, uh, but we didn't get any major show-stopping objections about things we'd done wrong in the design. So uh, we submitted draft 06, uh, in time for the draft cutoff deadline to give people a chance to review that and hopefully confirm that the working group feedback was adequately addressed. Uh, we got some additional comments from Paul and we actually updated that again this week because uh, we're kind of keen to move this forwards. Uh, uh, DNS push notifications depend on this document being published. And uh, one of the open questions in that was, uh, do we require replies for every message or not. And until this working group had actually got consensus on that issue, we didn't know how to define the push notifications. The uh, discovery relay had the same question that uh, the technology it was building on was still uncertain. Uh, and both of those are required for the discovery proxy. So the DNSSD working group is keen to have these questions settled so they don't keep changing. and. Uh, that's why we were keen to get the document updated right away, stay on top of addressing the feedback that we got. We feel this is now ready for IETF last call, and that's why I'm here presenting this, to see if anybody in the room disagrees, if anybody feels their feedback was not adequately addressed. Well, I'm not seeing any objections, which is exactly what exactly what I was hoping for. Of course, we'll confirm this on the list. But. I, yeah, I was hoping also to see if folks had actually probably had sort of seen all the updates and had sort of been following along. So the, doc, the newer document has been simplified. It's been, it's been cleaned up a lot from the previous things. I'm sorry, ahead, I David. didn't quite follow the question. Can you? Oh, oh, um, can we get like a, like a hum? Have people read the like the latest version? I got a hum. Okay, so at least people are reading it. David. Yeah, exactly what I want to say. David Skenazi, Apple. Just wanted to say that I've read this document and I really enjoy like the changes that have come in and I think it's ready to move forward. Okay. Yep. All right, thank you. Oh, cool. Thank you. Oh, I think it's Jim. It's going to be the, um, I'll show you right here. Oh, Mr. Abley. Catch him before he disappears again. You are a hard man to track down when I want you. I know. It just happens. I'm trying to care. I, where do I stand? Is there a box to stand in? Oh, yes, I'll get there. You can stand right there. Okay. Hi. Um, so this is a draft that it did languish for a while, about a year. When Richard Gibson said it was the fastest turnaround he'd ever seen on comment, the average is still really bad. <laughs> um, so the last round of changes we did was basically comments from the last working group last call. They're all relatively minor. Richard's happy now. I don't believe there are any other outstanding concerns about it, except the same sort of concern that you would have about a fish that had been slowly decomposing in the back of the car. Yeah. <laughs> it is a, a kind of a nasty idea. Um, no one's suggesting that anybody has to do this. For some people, it solves problems. Oliver was telling me that uh, he is now responding like this to 300,000 any queries per day, which is enough to be useful for him. And he has not identified any problems, or at least no problems have been reported. Um, so 
we think it's ready to go and it's been uh, the smell of the fish is not going to get any better by waiting longer. Um, so we think it's done. What do you think? Yeah, our feeling was, um, barring any sort of massive normal change, we'd do like a one week follow up working group last call and just sort of get it moving sort of thing. Who has read the most recent version? Yay. Okay. And no, there, there are no imminent explosions in the room that as far as I can see. Okay, then yep. that plan. I'll, I'll say my name was in the H info response that Cloudflare sent out for a long <laughs> time. So I did get some mail when he first started doing it, but it was mainly like, ha ha, I saw your name. And that was it. <laughs> Don't run away, I guess. Okay, thank you, Joe. Uh, Jim? Yep. The, the DNS capture format stuff. Wow. Ah, it's Christmas. Right. Okay, DNS capture format. Now, for uh, those of you quickly who haven't come across this yet, uh, this is uh, about space efficient storage of large packet captures uh, of DNS traffic. We're using a format based on Seabor. We're getting about 40% of the size of a PCAP capture after both have been through general purpose of compression. Um, and furthermore, compressing our Seabor output uses a lot less CPU than compressing C uh, PCAP. Uh, basically, we are com our basic record is a combined query and response. We're blocking these into groups of several thousand, abstracting common data from them. So it's a reasonably complex format, but it's doing what we need it to do. Now, the last time we discussed this in public was uh, in Prague last year when we were discussing draft 03. We're now up to draft 06. Draft 04 we released uh, at the start of this year, really just with a few editorial changes and a holding pattern. Draft 05 uh, addressed most of the comments, well, all the comments that we'd received on draft 03. So the big changes in draft 5 and indeed 6 are. The big one, there are now no mandatory items in top level tables. This gives rise to a problem where if an item isn't there, is it because you're not collecting it or because it wasn't actually there in the original packet? So we've included some hints for readers of the file so that they can determine which one of those cases uh, was the case. Uh, to this end, we've uh, reworked the file preamble which previously basically just contained configuration information, information on how a capture was configured. Um, we've now split it out into information on the storage, what's actually in the file, and then configuration items as before. Um, and we've extended this so that you can re-specify storage parameters at the start of each block as we go through the file. The intention here is to allow merging of CDNS files at the block level, so you can interleave blocks from two different uh, original CDNS files safely. Um, the other major change is, uh, <coughs> the next major change, I should say, IP address flexibility. We got asked if we could store IP addresses at a granularity below the full address. Um, so we've done that. Uh, though currently that's uh, specified. You specify a prefix as part of the storage information. We've added a mechanism to store malformed messages. If a message fails to full decoding, then we class it as malformed. And there's a separate data area within the file in which the raw malformed data gets stored. Uh, we were asked for the previous draft uh, had timing resolutions of second and microsecond with optional picosecond in. Um, we were asked if we could uh, vary the um, precision of this. So we've switched instead to a second and a fractional second value and the uh, resolution of that fractional second is now one of the storage parameters. 
Uh, we've been through and added items uh, obtainable from within side name servers, which we previously hadn't had. Um, so for those of you uh, using DNS tap, um, we can <coughs> you can put your DNS tap data in now. And we've clarified the extension mechanism. Um, most of the data gets stored in Seaborn maps with integer. Uh, uh, integer keys, uh, so we're now specifying that negative integers are reserved for implementation specific extensions. Now, we've got a few discussion points here. Um, the first one, I just mentioned that we are, we are currently defining malformed messages as those that could not be fully parsed. Okay. Uh, the draft three had a discussion of a distinction between partially parsed and, uh, sorry, partially malformed and fully malformed messages. Uh, we didn't get any feedback uh, or any indication that anybody felt um, partially malformed messages were of great interest or uh, the distinction was worth mentioning, so we've removed that. But we think possibly we need to make it more clear in the draft that we are assuming that all stored messages are fully parsed, um, including all the RRs. So, we also have outstanding requests for two things. First of all, uh, making RR, the storage of our data optional in RR storage. Now, RRs are optional, are optional items already. The question is whether you'd want to be able to specify that the R data within an RR is also optional. Okay, so you could include an RR without the R data. Um, this is a very small change and one that we're very minded to go ahead with. Uh, the other request that we've had is for variable IP address storage. Now, I mentioned earlier we've already done this at the file level, but we've actually had a request for this to happen at the per individual address level within the file. Um, our feeling at the moment is that we think this is probably a somewhat specialized requirement, it's possibly best left for an extension, but we would welcome some more comments. Right, that's our summary. <laughs> Anybody, anything to add? I have a couple questions. Um, you're currently deploying this inside the, some of the TL, some of the root name servers, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Well, or, we are deployed inside some of the root name yeah. servers. That's currently at the draft 03 level. Um, are you deploying? Are you storing the R data as well? We are storing okay. absolutely everything. Okay. At the moment. Um, I would say. Okay. I'll let Jim talk, and I was going to say. Um, we should probably take some of that to list and sort of figure out how to sort of get those resolved. Okay, Mr. Reed. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Uh, if I remember correctly, there were problems with an, an IPR claim on this work. Has there been any progress on that? Uh, sorry, I couldn't. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, finding, I'm finding the PA very hard to yeah. follow. Okay, Jim Reed. Uh, has there been any progress on the IPR issues related to this work? Not to my knowledge. Okay. The IPR issues, they get dealt with up the chain. Suzanne will probably sort of can speak on that, but basically we just push it along. We sort of mention the IPR and we push it along and we let the ISG and all those people who get paid lots of money to sort of sort all that out. Okay. Okay. But I would say that, um, our feeling was once these kind of, you know, and I know you guys did a hackathon thing and you had sort of resolved some of the issues about some of the data stuff. Um, if we can sort of break these two sort of things up to the list and get some, and that's just, I, I want to sort of move that along. I think it's actually ready, especially yeah. since you guys are using it. Um, yeah. And that would make somebody else that I report to kind of happy as well. <laughs> Okay, Terry. <laughs> so, okay, let's make people happy then. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we, we'll address those last two questions straight to the list. Yeah. Well, okay, thank you. We do have a little bit of time. You know, we're not pressed for yeah. time quite as much as usual. Um, so, if it would benefit, you know, to try to thrash out any of this now, people have strong strong views. There are microphones. 
They're going to go home and think about it, I guess. <laughs> so, well, I think we've, yeah, and we've sort of hashed out a lot of the, 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 the data format stuff in some of the previous meetings and stuff. So this is sort of covering the edges. So, so, okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you, Jim. All right. Thank you. Yep. So I have Paul up for um, KSK role, but I think actually it's Warren um, <laughs> because you're both kind of the same. The yes. So for, for some reason I had Paul on the agenda to talk about KSK uh, Sentinel, but I, yeah, I apologize for that. Yeah. Oi. So, yeah, this is just going to be some updates on changes we've made since um, the last, last IETF. Um, first off, thank you to everyone who's been sending us pull requests. It's made life way better. You know, having actual provided text is great. Um, so, the major changes. First off, we added a conversational description on how this actually works. Um, a lot of people found it very confusing because it said sort of this person sets this, this person sets this, but no sort of what you actually do with this information and why you might want to use this. So I think that was a, a good, good addition. Um, we also clarified that the trust anchor that's being discussed when you look up the key tag is the active one for the root, um, not one that's an ad pending or any other sort of 5011 state or revoked or something, one that you would actually possibly use for validation. Not actually what you did use for validation, but one that would be um, acceptable for validation. Um, there were a lot of readability fixes, so thank you everyone for those. Um, silly little things like the examples we hadn't made fully qualified, now we are, so that makes stuff a lot better for readability. Um, there were some privacy clarifications. Um, I think Dwayne sent those in, thank you very much for those. And then recently, um, actually this afternoon, we integrated another pull request from Paul Hoffman, thank you, um, explaining why we're do returning so fail and not an X domain. And I think that makes it a lot easier to understand. Um, another obvious one is the whole names discussion. Um, it started off being underscore is TA or underscore not TA. Um, turns out that didn't work so well with A records. So it then became KSK or Sentinel is TA with the hex key ID. And the final one, which we've settled on, um, is KSK Sentinel is TA and then a five digit decimal key. Um, for folk who would actually like to see how it works, the slide deck has many more slides in it. Feel free to flip through and or talk to one of the authors. I don't think we have time to actually present it. Um, but there is a demo at ksktest.net. Um, Ray Bellis just sent me a link to one as well, like a few minutes ago. And someone else has a demo. Ah, Paul Hoffman has a working demo. Um, so people can actually have a look at it. Oh, URL. Paul Hoffman, just a quick note. One of the reasons why there are multiple demos is we're actually testing using different JavaScript. Yes. Yep. Yep. Um, so yeah, this is implemented with some fairly horrendous JavaScript, my version, um, and you know, it says this, feel free to have a look at the JavaScript to understand better how it works, the reasoning behind it, etc. It's of course also documented in the draft. Um, and questions? I, this was better as a I have one, as a Warren. Yep. So I, in, in Singapore, a somewhat nice uh, ICANN person came and said that they were very interested in having this sort of move forward. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that we actually sort of addressed all their their concerns and stuff like that. So, yeah. so, so. yeah, the, we think that we have addressed all of the outstanding concerns. Um, if we missed any, first off, apologies. But secondary, please remind us, come along and, and let us know that we missed your comments. But we believe that it's all good and up to date. and. Um, you know, 13 closed PRs. I do not believe we have any open issues, and I think we've been good at scrubbing the mailing list. Yep. They're the largest, and, and the ICANN folks, the root servers are the largest consumers of the, this is all about the KSK role stuff, so. Yeah. Yep. You know, the ICANN or the key If you've been to the last ICANN meeting or OR, you've seen the, you've seen Matt Larson's talk over and over again. And, and David Conrad's gonna talk about it Thursday afternoon in the 
working group chairs lunch, I think. So because they just can't stop talking about it. Yeah, so. actually, I think it's the Thursday presentation lunch yep. big thing. Yep. Um, no questions? Easy. Easy. Yeah, we would, we would actually like to start the working group last call on this as soon as possible. Yep. So unless somebody has a problem with that. So. Yep. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So um, briefly, uh, we wanted to cover the, uh, the purpose and fate of the A-name draft. Uh, A-name is a solution to the long-standing Apex C-name problem. Everybody wants to be able to have uh, C-names at their Apex so they can take advantage of CDN uh, uh, optimizations. Not currently possible because C-name can't, can't share a node with the, uh, with the other R types at the origin. This has a great deal of demand in the industry. There are five or six different implementations from different DNS implementations and, uh, and uh, DNS hosting services. So it's time for a standard. Yep. The uh, existing draft has been around for about a year. It, um, due to a lack of attention, it, it expired and has been brought back to life. It's not really ready to proceed forward though yet, however, because there are, in the first place, um, issues with the, uh, with the recursive side of the protocol that we're proposing that uh, turned out to have been inadequately thought out edge cases involving DNSSEC validation. And um, sorting that out, although we do, have, uh, we do have ideas for how to sort it out, um, trying to write it, uh, we ran into a bit of a wall because the recursive and authoritative sides are uh, somewhat intertwined in the draft. So we would like to propose splitting the, uh, the draft that we've written into two separate ones, one covering the authoritative behavior, the other covering the recursive uh, behavior. And uh, the authoritative one we think can probably progress quickly and the recursive one is going to be more controversial and take longer. Um, that's pretty much all that I have now. I wanted to hasten through my time slot so people could get up to microphones and yell at me if they wanted to. Um, Evan, but sorry. Yes. Um, when do you think you'll have just the auth version of the draft sort of? Probably within a month. And the the other thing you failed to mention as use cases is having having that at the, having something sort of standardized allows extra to work. Oh, yes, yes. Yes, yes, you forgot that. So across vendor, so. I'd like to find out whether the idea of splitting the draft and carrying forward yes. with two drafts is controversial that or not. Was, that was the thing, we, that was my next thing too. So I'd like to hear from folks we would like to hear from folks if they think that's crazy. Yay. Uh, David Lawrence, I'm not sure of the full value of it, but I definitely would not say it's crazy um, because this is one of the things that frequently happens throughout specifications in that the view of the DNS from an authoritative point of view and that of from a resolver point of view um, have some interesting boundaries that are not always all that clear in the documentation that we write and at least separating them would bring into focus the considerations for each side of that transaction. So in that regard, I'm in favor of it. Um, I'm not sure how much is going to help, but not crazy. Matthias Mekking, um, I think it's a very same idea to split the documents because it is very pragmatic to focus on one thing ship it focus on the next thing um, if you keep them combined i fear there is much more discussion it will take a longer time to get something out the door so nothing controversial i think uh, it, i think it's a good idea i also have some thoughts because uh, the draft says and as you mentioned there are different implementations by different vendors uh, and they like to this uh, this draft uh, would like to replace all of them, so that everyone is using a name. Um, so I, I'm not sure if currently a name will cover all the use cases that people will implement in senior flattering alias, whatever it's called. Uh, so maybe it's a good uh, exercise to get together, maybe one-on-one, -on -one, and uh, see what features uh, we actually want out of uh, a name. So 
not that we get a draft in the end that nobody is going to implement because oh, hey, this feature is missing a name, so we're still using our, our version. So that's a thought. Sam Weiler, edge cases are painful, <laughs> and often they are interleaved. So I, I, I see danger. Often hmm? they are interleaved on the client and server side, and and so I see splitting this as probably unwise. You might find edge cases in one that have to get fixed in the other. Did you say wise or unwise? Splitting is unwise. Unwise. Okay. Or crazy, as I think the chair. Okay. Put <laughs> Thank you, this is crazy. Uh, hi, I'm Andrew Sullivan. Uh, so I, I, I would not say it is crazy to split this because I understand what the goal would be. But I'm trying to understand, you know, if you're an implementer, how, what you do in that case. You've got a document that um, you know tells you what this RR type does in an authoritative uh, server, and then. Uh, a different document that tells you how that RR type works in in, in other contexts, and that is that's a little weird, at <laughs> the very least. Can I? Uh, the behavior of the resolver is optional in the case of a name. We're we're specifying a behavior that authoritative servers will engage in, where if you have an a name specified, you receive an address query, you'll return the a name and the uh, and the address that you resolved from the a name target. Right. Uh, a resolver that doesn't implement a name will be able to use the address that the authoritative server re returned. Right. A resolver that does implement a name mm -hmm. optionally may improve that answer by requerying by itself. That's really two different things. It, well, so it's, it's here's how you use a name if you're an authoritative op if you're an authoritative server, and here's how you can use a name even better if you're a recursive operator. That's the intention here. I, I I understood the intention, and I mean I, I I see that case, but I'm just I I guess maybe it's the same thing that Sam was saying about edge cases. I, one thing that particularly terrifies me about this is the potential for there to be drift between the authoritative case and and what happens there, and then what the you know what a, a recursive server or something like that does, and I. I just, it terrifies me of the, the potential for um, uh, for injection here. I At a previous um, uh, um, DNS op meeting, I guess I got up and ranted a little bit about, um, uh, you know, sort of slouching towards architectural change without having a, a kind of architectural view. And I threatened to write a document but never did because I decided the thing that John Clemson wrote was good enough and now it seems that Bert's going to do the other half of that. Um, and it, it seems to me though that this is the kind of thing where I, I worry about that a little bit, right? We're really stretching stretching the meaning of, of, of an RR type if you could have literally a different meaning for, um, uh, for recursive. It can't be literally a different meaning, it's got to be the same meaning, right? That the basically the the name server side sort of has to work the same way for a recursive um, and I, I guess I'm just a little nervous that we could introduce a, a, a some pain there so so that's the reason that I'm uncomfortable with it but it's not crazy <laughs> thank you I thank feel you. better thank you Ava. hold on hold on so 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 Andrew is that that you are in favor of splitting it or against it <laughs> uh, I'm I'm not willing to say never do that. <laughs> but I think it's a bad idea. It's the bad idea, Ferry, coming out. Okay. I tried. <laughs> we'll put you down as not enthusiastic then. Uh, Tony Finch, I uh, put me in the crazy camp, um, as, it, as it were. Um, <laughs> I, I think um, that there's a uh, risk of uh, if. The, if the behavior of a name is not thought through from end to end of missing edge cases, as others have already said. So um, I have one other point, which is I'm willing to help with wording and, and authoring and stuff if you want me to. Okay. Uh, Wes Herdiker, USC, I say. Um, so I flipped my opinion twice in line. Um, <laughs> I was going to start off by saying, you know what, it's actually okay if they were split documents with one caveat, which is that they must, with a capital U, be put together forward. In other words, you can't advance one in front of the other because of all the educationists people were just mentioning. But the reality is, is then I kind of realized the problem is that if, if future working groups like only do a biz on one of them, then 
then they may leave out edge cases. So I'm back, you know, since the big back of the line, I'm now back in my original frame of mind, which is no, they should stay together. And really you're just doing it for documentational convenience. And I think we have section numbering for that. Okay. Uh, that here. Um, I don't have a particular uh, preference of uh, the splitting itself, but uh, uh, I really like to uh, be serious about the recursive side because even if it's very long term project, uh, the authoritative only mode is a hack. So um, I'm afraid that the splitting it could be uh, used as kind of an uh, excuse of uh, not being very serious about it. Ben okay. Hoofrein uh, in Elnet Labs. Uh, plus one, plus one for Wes, indeed. The plus same one for Wes. Uh, uh, the same consideration. Ah. So, if you combine it, they should be shipped together, not uh, one split one to make progress on the authoritative, and then wait for the recursive. And we only discuss splitting the document, or can I also again <laughs> give a suggestion on the authoritative part? I, I didn't understand the question. Oh, sorry. Do we now only discuss the splitting of the document? No. Uh, yeah. No, that, for me was, that was for me was the big question, and yeah. I'm yeah. Uh, I'm surprised at the answer that we're getting here. Um, uh, but I'm gratified that we're not getting the one that I feared, which was yes, yeah, split the document and then don't progress the re the recursive one because I thought that was going to be the one that was right. okay. was more controversial Sorry. of the two. But um, yeah, if uh, if the consensus is it would be better to yeah. keep it as one document and just work harder on making that document clear, then I'll I'll do that. Okay. And uh, happy to happy to help here. Also, because of the authoritative, uh, we are very well. We and other labs <laughs> also think that the offline—it's implicitly uh, in the document, but offline case case uh, of offline signing, mm -hmm. kind of the scenario should be well, not maybe very explicit, but it should be made pos uh, clear that it is possible. Still, it's not only dynamic signing of online okay. signing. Okay. okay, thanks. But uh, I'm happy to provide text or whatever. John Levine, I agree. We all know this is a problem we need to solve because we've all solved it badly. And in uh, keeping with the tradition of solving, keeping with it, with the tradition of solving it badly, I wondered if you had considered having a name return the original A in quad A record through the original name and the original signature. Um, and I have no idea how many resolvers would say, "Oh yeah, it's an A record," you know, sort of like a C name, and how many would barf because if 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 the resolvers were happy with that, I think you, you could spend that sort of that finesses the DNS tech problem because you got the original signatures. Um, it finesses the authoritative versus cache problem because you can do that. You can do that same gimmick both places. And, you know, I think ultimately what we're going to have to do, um, not to get off into technical weeds, but I, I think what we're going to have to do is pass along the original A and quad A. Uh, to the client regardless yeah. and uh, improve the answer and send the improved answer and the additional section only. Uh, that seems to be the only way that we can provide the improved information while, without risking validation problems in the case of a, of a stub that is validating but is not a name aware. Yeah, I mean, I mean, <sighs> I guess <clears throat> it's it's kind of it's kind of ugly, but I, I don't see a better yeah. A better I mean, way to I, do it. I, I guess I'm waiting to see worked out examples where the DNS sec actually works, and then I, then then I think we should we should rocket this ahead because it solves a real problem. Uh, Matthijs Mekking again. Just one more comment on splitting the document. So I I, I said I was in favor of pragmatic reasons. I assume uh, it was suggested to split it up for those uh, exact reasons. Uh, so, uh, but if uh, the uh, consensus is that uh, these things should be shipped together, uh, you could still, I guess, uh, uh, move forward by tackling first authoritative, yep. and then once you have that, uh, you sort of reduce the scope for recursive, and then you can focus on the optional improvement for aiming in the recursive. So, that's another thought. So, Evan, I think. I mean, it sounded like you had some, you know, the intertwining of the auth and resolver in the document. So I'm, I'm hearing that folks like Sam and Wes are signing up to actually help you sort of untangle that in the draft. So it's a little, so you can maybe split it out a little more clearer. So, so I'm, I've just put your name on something, Sam. So yeah, yeah. Let, let's. <laughs> so no problem. I you know, yeah. What, what is that? I think that would help you. I think help you guys as well. Sure. Yeah. You know, 
what it sounds like is what is people are not keen on two documents and no hats. I can I can understand that, but also that it would be more understandable if it was reorganized. And what we need. Yeah, that's for this. definitely the case. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The the reason the reason for splitting the documents is number one, we've got the authoritative behavior pretty well worked out in our heads. I think uh, the recursive behavior is the one that we're th that we're still discussing. <laughs> number two, uh, rewriting the document in such a way as to make it uh, less tangled. Yes. Would be harder than writing two documents. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, but okay, we'll do the extra work. I, yeah. I will. I will take the. Uh, I will take the extra time to be terser. Well, and, but also for the room, um, this is a good example of a situation where we've got work that people want to do, but we need people to sort of commit and and bear down. So, what we need for the next phase for you is people that are committed to reviewing new, you know, proposed new text, participating in the GitHub or whatever mm -hmm. you're, you're you're doing, and we'll be able to really help make. The, the the next the next version yeah. more understandable along the lines of what we're talking about here. So I, I think I agree. So, if we had two documents, it would just be madness as we go down the road, right? So. And I saw our secretary okay, running thanks. for the microphone. Yeah. Um, so, if you are going to do the detangling, I propose that folks like John Levine not contribute to the first untangled draft. That is, let's see whether the untangling worked yeah. before we actually go into the protocol stuff. Yes. Okay, fair enough. Yep. So, can, can we get some hands of some folks to help? Uh, okay, on the untangling, Sam, I'm going to sign you up. I, I'm sorry about that. So, <laughs> um, I see Tony, excellent, crazy Tony, um, Benno, um, guys, Paul. So, thanks all, because because I think that will that would actually probably help you guys, you know, you know even if you made two drafts and then put them together at the last minute, right? It's something, yeah, you know, anyway. Okay. Who's okay. next? Okay. Oh, Joe. And we're good on time here, so. So this sort of came up discussing the 5011 stuff. You know, it's, that's a fairly contentious sort of process. But something that's come up sort of in the operational world, uh, in sort of my daily thing is, is can we roll keys faster, right? And so, or are there different ways of doing it than the 5011 method? And, and so I, I ran into Joe, wanted to resurrect these drafts, which I think is complementary to what's going on on that side. Is that the best way to put it? Yes, yeah, that sounds good. I'm standing up here because it's higher. Um, <laughs> and I can see the slides. Um, so here's a history lesson because nobody's heard anything about the KSK for such a long time now. The, um, <laughs> when, when we signed the thing in, in 2010, we published a trust anchor in various ways. And at the time, I don't think this was the most interesting part of the process and people generally ignored it. But we did eventually document it. It was an internet draft that languished forever and then somebody um, very kindly rescued it and, and shepherded it through the final steps and it's 7958. And that describes how to retrieve a trust anchor as ICANN publishes it. Um, it's an XML document. There's various other formats. There's HTTP URLs that are stable. There's ways of retrieving the trust anchor. And I think outside Unbound Anchor, which is a tool that ships with Unbound, I don't think anybody does this. And um, I think that's kind of a problem. There's obvious typo in this slide. But um, so we were going to we were going to roll. Well, we I keep saying we. Well, it is we. We're the with the general community. It's us, and I can and our slaves. And uh, so we were going to roll the KSK um, last October, and then we didn't because maybe there was a problem or something. And I'm not going to try and channel Matt, Matt Larson, um, who is on the jabber, cringing right now. But um, so it was postponed until this year in October. That's the, the current public comment open that I can. If you have an opinion, Matt would really like, I'm sure, for people to go and say yes or no, this plan is good. You should Google for that. Because um, at the moment, the number of um, responses is making Matt cry. Um, but we, I don't think we're actually necessarily much closer to understanding what's going on. I pers my personal opinion is that we should roll it. And I think there's no sign of any impending damage. However, I think we've all become a little bit too fixated on 5011 and whether 5011 is good and how it's implemented and whether there have been regressions in particular resolvers about 5011. And it's all 5011, 5011, 5011. 
And everybody's forgotten that that's actually not the way that we publish trust anchors. And we publish trust anchors in a different way. This is a, a mechanism for maintaining a trust anchor once you already trust one. But we actually have publication methods that mean you can go and fetch a fresh one. And I, I sense that some people have forgotten this, and they're so fixated with whether 5011 works or not, they've forgotten that the original bootstrapping was supposed to be different. So I don't, I don't think it's necessarily all that fair to make this ICANN's problem, to be honest. I think this started off as a, a project that was designed by a small number of organizations with lots of community input, but it's kind of 10 years on now. We have, is it 10 years on? Not quite, eight years on. We have the opportunity to actually sort of decide in the IETF how we do some of this stuff, and I think maybe we should. I think we should take some responsibility for how these mechanisms are supposed to work. So, it turns out, with a great deal of prescience, back in 2011, Dave Knight and I wrote a draft, sorry for the alarming visual, um, by which I mean that we have an affiliate and new star author on the same draft. Yeah. Uh, but we wrote this draft back in, in 2011, and I just revved it and sent it in, and because Dave and my email addresses from ICANN haven't worked for a long time, we had to change the name, so I changed it to something very different from validator bootstrap to bootstrap validator. And it's the same text. All I did was change one reference and add a zombie joke at the end in case anybody's reading. Um, but that's it, apart from that, it's exactly the same draft. And it's not actually too bad. I don't think it's ready, but I think it's, it's actually reasonable. And it describes things like synchronizing clocks first before you decide to validate, because that seems like a good idea. Um, it, it talks about different ways you can pull the trust anchor. It talks about when you can validate and when you shouldn't. I think it gives reasonable advice. I don't know that it's detailed enough. Some of it might need to be revved because time has moved on. Um, but I think generally this is a gap, and I think we should fill it in this working group. I think this is a good thing for the working group to work on. So that's it. Um, I submitted it yesterday or something. I mean, no doubt you all remember it with vivid clarity from 2011 when you reviewed it diligently then. Um, but you know, you might want to refresh your memory. But in any case, open question to the chairs, I guess, is do you think um, we should pick this up? If you do, I'm very happy to continue working on it. So is Dave. What? You're not going to run off? I might run off. OK. Yeah. But okay. you know, Dave's more reliable than I am. Yeah. So. Um, so what do people think? This is a draft about how to bootstrap trust for a validator in a situation where either 5011 is not working for you, or you don't have an opportunity yeah. to do 5011 because um, you, you're just starting for the first time and you have no trusted Excellent. prior key. Uh, Wes Herdiker, USC, I say, um, we should chat <laughs> because we are working on something as well and maybe there's some merging that might be good. Uh, we being Warren, Kamari, and I. Okay, that's good. I, I have heard other people are interested in replacing 5011, which I think is a lovely idea. Um, beautiful that 5011 is, but I don't think that's in conflict with this. I think we still need a way of bootstrapping a validator when we don't already have something to trust. Paul Vart is right at. Um, I would also definitely like to see 5011 replaced with something else. The 30-day the magical destruction period is really awkward. And uh, so something faster would be nice, but of course faster also means more risk in, in, in attack. So we have to find a, a good compromise between that. So as well as replacing 5011, do you also think we need a way, before we trust anything, of trusting something? Because that's what this draft is about. This is not actually about replacing 5011. Yes, because if at some point you don't trust a historical key, you're back at that exact same spot. Paul Orgumason. I support this document. I think having multiple mechanisms is a good way forward. Yep. David Conrad strongly support this document. We'll actually read okay. it and comment and stuff like that. Cool. Jeff Houston, I support it too for a subtly different reason. 5011 always assumes continuity of integrity in a key. If for any reason the current key becomes unobtainable, unusable, or compromised in any way, we're back to square zero with nothing. And, and this at least is an alternative way of looking at that and might come in handy at some vague and indefinite point in the future. So I'd encourage it, thank you. Excellent. I'm gonna point out, we had this pretty much roughly the same discussion back when this first thing came up. Main problem, huh? We're getting good at it. Well, we're yeah. getting good at the discussion, but 
again, all this is doing is pushing off the trust into some other space. You have to trust a CA key before you can trust the trust anchor key, which means you now have to select a set of CAs that are gonna be valid and make sure everybody has them and hope they don't go dead. Because again, same problem. So I, this is just an off by, this is you know solving the problem by in, in direction. Um, 5011 was designed to deal with the existing trust anchor set, which had to be established manually because we'd never done it before, and to carry it forward. I, th I think that's a good point. I, I should point out that the mechanisms that this refers to, this draft, is based on the other draft, which describes how ICANN publishes things. No doubt ICANN could publish things in a different way in the future, and no doubt this draft could change. And I'm more interested really in the general concept. I think, you know, before you can trust something, as you say, you need a manual configuration. Um, this is about that manual con configuration. I hear you. Uh, Nick Johnson, Ethereum Foundation. Um, it, like the previous commenter, it's unclear to me that uh, we can trust a CA search for longer than we can trust a KSK. And I'm also concerned that for uh, validators with resource constraints, uh, requiring them to be able to do HTTP requests and validate CAs is a significant additional burden. And I wonder if there isn't a simpler proposal around having a longer lived KSK that is, is better protected and gives you equivalent security. Thanks. I, I, I would encourage people not to fixate on the fact that there are certificates mentioned in this document because it's, that's just mapping what ICANN decided to do. I believe that ICANN's thinking at the time was there are people who distribute codes in the form of software updates that are signed with a key. And if you trust that code because you trust that key, perhaps that's also a useful path of trust to trusting the, the trust anchor. That's my recollection of other people at the time. Don't shoot me for that. That's the decision that was made at the time. This doc document here is really concerned with how do we start trusting something. It could be manual or it could be automatic. And I think the observation during this key roll process, if it was something, some alternate method that was automatic, that might help us roll the key. Uh, my name is Andrew Sullivan. Uh, uh, every time this topic comes up, I think Mike was quite correct that uh, we've had this conversation before, but every time this conversation comes up, it seems to me that what we're trying to do is find the one true way that you're going to get this key, and that's just the wrong plan. There's lots of different ways that you could bootstrap this trust. This is a way, um, and it seems that this is a way that actually has the benefit that it maps onto something that people are already doing. So, um, you know, it, it seems good to me to write it down and have this um, this mechanism. Uh, that doesn't mean that, you know, this is the right way for everyone uh, or it's the right way, um, you know, for every context or anything like that. But a lot of people already have a set of CAs that they trust. Um, and so it doesn't seem to me to be weird to say, and if you already trust that, then, you know, you can trust this too. Uh, and I think that that's a that's the sort of way that we have to ha have to approach this. I don't believe that there is one true way uh, to to do this, and I think that it has been a mistake uh, that the DNS community has occasionally made that we try to do that. We try to make it always in the protocol because it doesn't always work for everybody's case. Thanks. Hi, Ron Fresic Surfnet. Um, first of all, I support this. It's a good idea to do to do this. I think. Um, Two remarks. So um, I think Microsoft DNS also pulls those trust anchors from that repository. It's not just Unbound that does that. Um, and for those people that don't trust CAs, um, I can print these and distribute them at the um, um, workshop in Madrid last year. Um, this is actually a, a really good way to boot, bootstrap stuff if you have the trusted community representatives at the KSK signing <laughs> ceremonies. They can, they can have a look and see if it's printed on the shirt correctly, wear them, walk around proudly as a community representative. I think that's a really good idea as an alternative. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just but, curious, but, did, but, did you, did but, you but actually am, check the key? Yeah, I am actually serious um, because there are, I mean, this the, the ICANN KSK show has been going around the world and they've been presenting everywhere. There are people from ICANN that have this DS up on slides every time. It is really, really hard to spoof that. You just look up five videos and if they have the same the S on it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I think that that's, makes total sense. However, I will point out that this draft scope is intended to be a little bit wider because it's also supposed to encompass unmanaged devices. So, yeah. You know. Dylan Torp, NL Net Labs. I uh, work on a validating step resolver called GetDNS. And uh, its intent is to be used for 
Dane validation, for example. So the semantics are very different than those of a running resolver, validating resolver. You don't know when applications will need validation, when, when they are started by the user. And uh, there, there could be uh, a period of more than 30 days in which application is not used. And also, uh, those applications uh, run in user space. So it's not safe enough to just save the trust anchor. You need the additional S-MIME signature, for example. And uh, Gatinas has a, uh, a method to do that. It also uses your RFC to fetch the trust anchor and save it with the S-MIME signature uh, in user space location. And uh, then, yeah, tracks the root trust anchor, et cetera. Uh, maybe uh, you could have a look at uh, what we uh, what we did and maybe incorporate in the in the document as well. So. Yep. I'll check it out. Thanks. Yep. Uh, Wes Hertiker, USCIS. Hi. Um, can I suggest a way forward from this discussion? Uh, that I think that there's a lot of people in this room that have been thinking about this problem lately. I'm betting. The person behind me, I'm betting uh, a large number of people from ICANN staff, I'm betting you know, myself, I'm betting a ton of protocol experts have been thinking about where do we go next. Um, this to me sounds like a complete session in say some IETF, possibly Montreal, where we give people some time to write up various ideas and then we talk about them because this is not going to be a 10 minute discussion about one draft. This is going to be a lot of drafts that really ought to all be considered with lots of brainstorming ahead of time so that we can make a informed uh, decision about what the right path forward is. So I don't disagree with that at all. Um, but I might suggest that given that we have some implementations of exactly this, we could publish this and then deprecate it and replace it rather than just continue to leave a gap? Um, two things. Yep. RC, sorry, Michael St. John's. Uh, 40, RC 4986 was actually the basis for RC 5011 and why it got the way it was. This particular thing was talked about before as part of that requirements document. Anybody should go and take a look at that one before throwing everything under the bus. Second thing about it, does your protocol include a protocol for updating the original CA trust anchor? No, it's, it's far more vague than that. I, I'm, I'm not suggesting this is good. Yeah, I'm just saying we've I, got a gap, and this currently describes what at least some people do. So yeah. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, to you know, fight with any other proposal. All I'm saying here is that if you're pushing off the problem to someone else, okay, that's, we just need to acknowledge that and, and go forward with it, and, and I'm fine with that. Well, not fine with that. I think it's actually a bad idea. But... Um, <laughs> But just hiding it by indirection isn't actually solving the problem because you still have thousands, tens of thousands of boxes with the CA public key in it that somehow, if that goes bad, you need to be able to figure out how to fix that. No, I think that's true. I, I don't know that there's a good answer. You talked about manual configuration of Trust Anchor to start with, but we do also have to include boxes that are not managed, boxes that sit on shelves, in warehouses, and suddenly you're expected to do validation at some point. If, if we expect the key roll to happen regularly in the future, like every year or something, you don't have to sit in a warehouse for that long before whatever you've got installed in you is, is inaccurate, and you have to have some way of bootstrapping from the network. So I don't know what the answer is, but I think it is a gap. And I, again, I think describing what we do right now is, has some value. And Michael, you can blame me, because I told him to, to, to put this together. So you can you know, just yell at me. It's OK. My name is Inigo Montoya. So what do you think about pre-signing? Pre-sign the next, pre-sign the revocation key. Get out there while your current key is active in assertion of what's coming next to allow people to build into shell units an assertion of the future state for some time when it doesn't fix every problem. It increases the buffer size that you have less to worry about. What do you think? Well, I, Which I, is an idea Russ Housley recently raised in the crypto working groups, an explicit I, idea for CAs. I, I, have, I have opinions about this, but I don't think this is the right place to share them. I think, I think there's a wider discussion that no doubt ICANN will convene at some point about the evolution of how they manage the KSK and publish new ones, and that would be great for that venue, but I don't think it's, it's directly related to this. 
Mike St. John's again, 5011 with the standby key is exactly that. Yep, I know that. Okay. 5011 without a standby key, however, is what we've got. So. Okay. Oh, Tony? Tony Finch, um, regarding Roland's idea of um, getting trust from lots of attestations from lots of people, uh, about four years ago, I wrote up a draft that was based on that idea, but as a protocol, um, that draft was not was overcomplicated, but it, it, I have ideas for simplifying it. The advantage of this is that um, it uh, gives you a certain degree of resilience because you don't have a single point of failure. So if your some of your witnesses, some of the people who are talk uh, who are saying this key is the right one disappear off for whatever reason you might still have a quorum that's big enough to uh, establish trust from from that but the idea is there's no single point of failure you're not just indirecting to some other tr route of trust so i think actually curiously this is not incompatible with that because this doesn't specify that you need one certificate or one way of trusting uh, you know, there's, one certificate. There's, there's, there's mu no potentially multiple, I and mean, you could have local policy that said, "I want to trust N of M if I misuse." Mike's just covers ears at this point because I'm misusing all kinds of terminology. Yeah, I know. Um, but it, I don't think it's incompatible with that. Right. No, and there were certainly many discussions in the course of building the DNSSEC RFCs around what is having local policy mean, and how do we enable multiple flowers to bloom? Maybe not a thousand, but certainly a few dozen. Mm -hmm. A thousand zombie arms to rise up from the earth. Yeah. <laughs> in any case, it sounds like there's there's some interest in pursuing this. Um, Joe, are you comfortable if we say people should send additional development for the idea, and you can maybe take a next row, ne next hack at the at the document. So I, I can take another hack at this zero zero. I think though, I mean, it's, this should just definitely not be my idea. I'm not qualified to design this, but I'm quite, I'm happy to be an editor. I think it's yeah. something that a working group could work on. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, the first thing I question is: Is it a working group document, and then we invite commentary, or is it is it a there, private thing that we decide later whether to adopt or not? I don't know. There are some folks. There are several folks who came up to the mic, and you know, including a couple. I think one or two ICANN people who said, you know, this is they support kind of looking at some of this. It may not be adopted, but it it, it definitely you know. And I don't want to turn this into let's make Mike St. John sad working group. So Mike, I'm sorry about that. Um, but um, sometimes you know, but. It, I heard enough interesting people supporting it that it's at least take, let's let's sort of think about it some more, right? I mean, the, you just published this, republished it Sunday, after yeah, so. And we've got a couple of folks also in the chat reminding, you know, remembering some of the older drafts that went through some of these ideas. So yeah, be the be be the idea collector and see where where this gets us. Yeah, so and if someone wants to assist Joe, because I have a feeling he's going to van it run away on me again. Um, I think Joe will like that as well. So, um, okay, thanks. So, um, before we get to the, the real fun part, um, just to sort of some recap some stuff, there's a couple drafts. It looks like we're going to do working group last call. We'll probably kick off this week. So, you probably see a spate of stuff coming through the mailing list. Do not panic. You know, um, it looks like session signaling, um, refuse any. And uh, KSK role, as long as they've all sort of addressed their sort of comments that have come up on the mailing list in the past couple of days sort of thing. So, um, and also the call for adoption on the TSIG biz one, which we're very happy to sort of move that along. So, great. So, this is what you've all been waiting for, I know. So, um, when Bert approached us, I was, as an operations person, I was like, yes, you know, I'm very interested in sort of this sort of how do we implement various bits of stuff. And sometimes we don't always think about it, but I know there's lots of vendors in here and lots of folks who sort of built this stuff. So, um, so Bert, this is your time. So. So much. So thank you, Bert. Okay. Hello. And good afternoon. Um, thank you for this slightly oddly titled uh, presentation, the DNS camel. Um, it has been pointed out to me that the camel is a very worthy animal and uh, can survive in harsh climates and with little sustenance. And indeed, this is true. The camel is a very impressive animal. Um, but the story also goes that, that once you overload the camel, a single straw can break its back. And that, that's the analogy I was uh, aiming for. 
Um, I'm I'm Bert Huber. I'm from PowerDNS. We are a, we write open source software. Um, we are very much an open source company. We are, however, also a 24/7 on-call uh, service provider with service level agreement backed support, and we are on the line for millions of euros in penalties if we don't solve your problem at 3 a.m. Uh, when it breaks. This gives us a sort of interesting perspective on uh, new standards. I found this glorious list on the ISC website. Is, is anyone present who made, who recognized this, this list and who made it? Uh, it's a yeah. team effort of three people I see. Can, that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful slide actually. It, it's actually, but I have another one. And, um, and, and I have another one. And, uh, and these are uh, shamelessly stolen from isc.org. These are, it's quite a good list of all the DNS relevant RFCs. And, um, wow. It's incomplete. It's, it's, it is incomplete. It has been known there are gaps in there, but that, that's actually good because I know some people will argue with uh, the next slide. I, th I think we're, we're halfway now, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Going on, yeah, ooh, yeah, there we are. 185 RFCs, which is 2,781 uh, pages. It's amazing. It's also twice the size of the C++ programming language, the fourth edition, <laughs> which is well known as the standard in documenting everything. Um, this is a ton of stuff. Of course, this was a naive edition of 185 RFC, so some of them are historical, some of them are maybe not super relevant. However, the list is also incomplete, so we, we could probably state a good claim that the DNS specification is now around 3,000 pages or a bit less. Um, many people have noted this. Um, interestingly, uh, when you participate in um, uh, RFPs, tendering processes for DNS standards, this list gets copy pasted in there and they ask you if you can state your compliance with all this glory <laughs> um and now that we have a little bit of time i, I could have on the power dns website we also have a list of compliant uh, rfcs and we put rfc 1925 in there uh the 12 fundamental networking truths which is an april 1st rfc yeah uh, but it's a very good one. It tells you a lot of fundamental things about the internet, which you should all know about. And we put it as a funny joke in our compliance table, and it ended up in an official procurement document. <laughs> and um, so we said we we're compliant. So that's good. Um, so we now have these, these well, 2,781 pages um, of DNS standards. And it's a lot. Now, a report from the field, because do we think that everyone has read all those uh, RFCs? No, no one can read all these RFCs or at least not know about them all the time. So we found this gem in production. Um, what does this code do? Let me first tell you how we discovered it. We did a big migration uh, to PowerDNS and all of a sudden a few percent of a subscriber customers base could no longer use the internet. They simply vanished. And we tried to do a TCP dump and figure out what was going on because no more DNS was coming out of these customers. They had one DNS query, that was the end of it. And we found out that the DNS component within the modem had actually crashed. But it only crashed on PowerDNS and not on Bind. So first we looked at what was PowerDNS doing wrong, which is the natural thing to do. And, um, and then we found out that uh, Bind, actually, and all name servers, compress the first answer record against the question. This is a very good idea. And that means that the first answer starts with two, two octets C00C, which is the label pointer to the question. And it turns out that this CPE, this modem, had decided that C00C was the start of answer marker. And it would simply scan for C00C and assume that the next four bytes would be an IP address. And PowerDNS supplied an answer without C00C. We have, of course, fixed this immediately. And the, and the thing crashed. And the author of this stuff uh, did not read all the RFCs. Um, in fact, they probably looked at a bunch of, of PCAPs and were like, hey, I get this. <laughs> this is a lot like how I implemented BGP recently. 
<laughs> which is also turns out to be easier to implement from Wireshark than, than from the RFCs. But anyhow, this is the operational reality. This stuff is in the field. So we can, we can write thousands of pages of standards and then we end up with this. Um, this is a, a graph, I like graphs. Um, this is the complexity of DNS over time. Uh, when I first got interested in DNS, A6 and binary labels were still a thing. And we thought this stuff is too complex. No, no one is going to get it. And some of you may remember, we did A6 uh, because we thought IPv6 addresses were too long to fit in 512 byte uh, UDP packets. So we made a sort of standard where if you put a whole bunch of uh, IPv6 addresses in there, you could compress them against each other. It's nice. And, but it was widely derided as, as too complex and too difficult. Um, we had a TSEC, we had a DNSSEC, and an NSEC3. Uh, a joke among implementers was that the three in NSEC3 stood for the number of people that really understood it. <laughs> um, and then people came to me, they said, Bert, it's not that hard. It's not that hard, you're just complaining because you have to implement that stuff and you hate DNSSEC. And it's 2018 and we're still having conferences with the good people of ISC and not an NLNet Labs to figure out corner cases. So the complexity of DNS went up enormously around that time. Uh, EDNS client subnet was added. Uh, I was in favor of EDNS client subnet because I thought it was a good idea and it turned out to be a horrible idea. Um, we had QNAME minimization, which is, as Stefan has pointed out, is not a DNS protocol feature, but it's something that should work. Uh, if everyone followed the standard, except that, that you have to work very hard to make it work for the people that did not follow the standard. So you see the complexity of the protocol go up over time. An interesting exercise for the reader is to take the glorious ISC RFC list and plot the number of lines of, of specification as an actual factor of time to see when it happened. Um, what is the upshot of this? Um, this is the future. So this, this, I scroll, I, I, this is the present and I zoomed a bit to the right. What more is on the horizon? So this is a, a quick scan of drafts that are being dis discussed right now and, and they will not do anything to reduce the complexity of DNS or DNS. So it's, it's, not, it's not getting any easier. Okay, fine. We have some very smart people here. Exceptionally smart people. And um, this is the number of people that can get the complexity <laughs> of DNS. And the big watershed moment was DNSSEC. When we added DNSSEC, we lost Mara DNS, we lost my DNS, we lost a whole bunch of name servers that were not able to find the bandwidth to keep up and implement um, uh, this, this, this standard. So, okay, you can say these people did not have enough time anyhow, so they deserved to get kicked out of the field, but hey, we lost, we lost some software there. Um, and as we add more and more stuff, eventually we will be left with like 20 people that really get it. Okay, is that a problem? This is the quality graph. Uh, and this is known to anyone that has ever done uh, product management in software. Quality goes down when you rapidly add new complexity. And then over time, the quality recovers. So the advent of DNSSEC saw a huge increase in the number of software vulnerabilities in uh, DNS products. There was a while that every DNS vulnerability that was found was related to a DNSSEC uh, record type or validation or an insist or whatever. This goes for all software products. Eventually we recovered. When DNSSEC was old enough, eventually we shook out all the bugs and we found it and quality recovered. It is my prediction that as the, the complexity increases and the number of people that actually get it decreases, this recovery in quality will stop and quality will go down again simply because there are only 20 people left that get it all and they're quite busy. So how, how does this kind of thing happen? Um, whenever a protocol or a piece of software or generally whatever evolves, it evolves because there are forces pulling on it. So we have DNS implementers that have certain ideas on where the DNS should be going. We have operators that have feelings about where the DNS should be going. We're actually doing this for people that use the internet. Uh, but they're usually not aware that they're using DNS, so they're, they're not much of a voice at the table. And then there are standardizers 
that sit here and for example um, as in the previous uh, two presentations ago where people say well we have this alias and a name and several competing implementations and then the standardizers together say well we're going to make a standard okay so these four forces on dns are interesting implementers we should be awed by the quality of the implementers of dns right now and I'm, I'm completely honest about this. There, there, I don't think there is any internet relevant protocol that has such quality implementations right now. You can, you go, you can download freely superb software right now. And, and we should all be super proud about that. I was in another working group here uh, a few hours ago and they were all begging for people to please implement this stuff. We do not have this problem. Everyone is implementing all that stuff and they're extremely smart people. So good stuff. Um, sometimes these programmers underestimate how smart they are in the sense that they are actually a lot smarter than they themselves think. This is unusual. Um, <laughs> this leads to statements like uh, NSEC 3 is not difficult. <laughs> these are also people that solve quantum mechanical constraints while bicycling. Um, some of them actually do, by the way. Um, so, so far, the implementation community has been able to keep up with all the standards easily enough. They say, okay, you, you wrote this massively complicated thing, we're on it. <laughs> and we'll do a hackathon and afterwards it's, it's there. And it has been tricky for the implementation community, ourselves and myself included, it has been tricky for us to say no. Because it's, it's sort, of, sort of embarrassing if you have to say that, yeah, you wrote this NSEC 5 and it's too difficult for me. I, I tried it and I, uh, I spent a whole week reading on, on, on pseudo random functions and stuff and I'm still lost. It's difficult to say, I'm, I don't get this. And you, when that happens, that is when the orange line goes down because there are people that say, look, I just, I have to check out because I don't understand NSEC 12. Um, <laughs> the second one is one of the other implementations will do it. So whenever one implementation says, well, we, we don't really feel uh, uh, like doing RFC 5100 because we think it's, it's too difficult and brittle, that's what we said, then everyone says, well, all the other ones did, you have to do it. You simply must do it. There's huge peer pressure for everyone to implement everything. And C, of course, it's a lot of fun to work on new stuff. So if you have a bug tracker with 200 issues in there, and some of them are festering bugs from festering users. And then there's a fun new feature. Well, we get on it. So as implementers, we do not have well-developed product management. So you come up with a new feature. I know some developers here are just sitting here like, I can't wait to check this in, to make this happen. So we do not provide, as implementers, we do not provide solid pushback when someone invents something new. In fact, we're like, bring it on. Operators. Um, so, in I'm normal. I, I of course we write software, but we're very deeply involved with the operational DNS resolver community. So these are the people that have 20 million customers and get measured by their governments on their performance. They are on call 24/7. Um, they are being uh, judged by the availability and performance of their name server, and by nothing else. So if you say, I enabled this privacy enhancing feature, but all your lookups are now one millisecond slower, no, it's not going to fly there. Um, and in fact, governments, specifically the UK government, performs measurements on DNS latencies. And they publish them as tables, and they order them by performance. And everyone jumps on that, of course. Which means that if you say, I'm going to do DNSSEC validation, you will fall to the bottom of the table immediately. And you might get a footnote that says, well, we commend provider X for doing DNSSEC, but you're in the slow lane. They will say, look, this provider, they're the 12th in the nation in terms of performance. I'm sorry? Query chain? Yeah. <laughs> sorry, okay, fine. So query chain brings it down to one query again. Awesome RFC, you should implement it. <laughs> I, I, would, I would love to uh, respond to you, but I cannot hear the question. But, but okay, I assume it was very witty and, and made fun of me. Um, these people are resource constrained. So we get Comcast here, and they're wonderful people. And they say, look, we have a small DNS team. It's 21 people. All my customers combined 
have a DNS team of 21 people. So most big service providers have one DNS person per 3 million subscribers. And they do not have a lot of bandwidth for any, any fancy interesting things. The interesting now is that these operators, they should be a limiting factor on the de development of DNS. They, they should say, look, uh, you made this complex. This is too operationally difficult for us. We're not going to do it. Um, so please reconsider. Make this simpler. Okay. The problem is these people are not in the room. The service providers of DNS that use, they typically ask us to say a few things on their behalf because they're not authorized by their... Uh, uh, their bosses to actually comment because they're they're not allowed to get up here and say our DNS is a mess it's a difficult thing so these people should provide pushback but they're not um, authoritative and resolver I will say a bit, be a bit briefer about this one it is quite easy to add features to an authoritative server because it turns out you can turn off an authoritative server for whole days before anyone notices um, an authoritative server has no probing, it has no state, it just serves data, it sits there. That means that if you have an, an authoritative server mindset, then it's quite easy to think up features like EDNS client subnet. Because the EDNS client subnet is, you get a question, you provide an answer. That's it. It's not that hard to do. If someone doesn't want an EDNS client subnet question, he should not send you, sorry, if someone doesn't want an EDNS client subnet answer, he should not send you an EDNS subnet client question. So it's quite easy from the authoritative side because authoritative servers can be down for days before anyone notices. The .nl uh, infrastructure, we had a server that was down for a whole day. The Belgian uh, CCTLD has had a server that's unreachable by half of the internet for half a year now. <laughs> and uh, apparently this is all fine. You can see this on the ripe uh, DNS mon, by the way. Um, the interesting thing is the authoritative server, the CCTLD people, are well represented here. So they can provide feedback. They can say, don't do this, do that, do this, do this. For example, the PCAP compression format we were discussing earlier, that comes straight from their operational experience. So the authoritative server people are well represented. The, the uh, DNS uh, uh, service provider people, not. Standardizers, welcome, hello. You are also among the smartest people in the world. And congratulations on that. And, uh, and indeed, no challenge is too, too hard. Um, if NSEC is not good enough, we'll, they'll, we'll come up with NSEC 3. And if NSEC 3 is not good enough, we'll come up with NSEC 5. And um, I, I was around when NSEC 3 happened, and people said, ah, we cannot solve this problem. There is no solution to this problem. And, they, and the standardizing community, and Roy, and other people went, ha, <laughs> and we will show you what we can do. Yeah. And that's really impressive. And, and uh, honestly, um, and the standardizers are on an, a mission to improve the internet. And they think full time, we have a whole room full of top quality brains thinking right now about how to improve the internet. The standardizing people, however, there is no such thing as 24-7 standardization SLA. So <laughs> it's rarely that someone goes up at 3 a.m. and says, I need a standard right now. There's an errata and it needs to go out <laughs> before noon. Um, this gives a slightly different mindset in terms of complexity. Because to a standardization person, actually, it's sort of fun to work on really complex puzzles. And, and, and be feel that you master all that, those complexities. But typically, as a standardizer, you don't have to think about that 3 a.m. call that says, well, it just crashed. Because, yeah, you'll hear about that in the morning as a standardizer, or maybe a week later. Um, standardizers are also, in some sense, optimists. Um, that they think that, look, uh, we made this complexity, and it, we thought it out pretty well, and now people will type it in. Okay. But simultaneously, standardizers are, are pretty distrustful because they're, they're quite sure that if they don't specify everything that the implementers, who are, of course, stupid, uh, will mess it up. Now, this is also in the forces model, who is determining what happens with DNS? The standardizers are um, underappreciative of operational 24-7 uh, on-call trade-offs. And this leads to one of the biggest points I'm hoping to make the unexpected interaction of features. Every time you add a new feature to DNS, it interacts with all the other existing features of DNS. Often in, unsurprising, in surprising ways. In ways which end up bloating the code base of resolvers tremendously. So for example, you have DNAME and DNSSEC. They're theoretically unrelated uh, uh, features. However, it turns out they collide. So you must special case DNAME and DNSSEC. 
Um, EDNS client subnet sounded like a great idea. It turned out that in production, it led to 0% cash hit rates. Because the assumption, the operational assumption, how big service providers would lay out their networks with maybe a slash 16 subnet here and a slash 12 subnet there turned out to be completely wrong. Actual service providers have slash 24 subnets, which means that they have 65,000 bins for EDNS client subnet answers, which means that you need whole new CPUs to deal with this trivial feature. Um, I didn't see that coming. And um, the authoritative server people also did not see it coming. Um, later, I spoke to a bunch of people that work at service providers. They did see it coming, uh, but they somehow did not find their voice. Every new feature that leads to probing, you should see the state machine that's in a name server right now, in a resolver, that it that needs to figure out, OK, I'm not getting a response. Was that packet loss, or did the other side simply not understand my question? I'm getting a bogus response. Was that because they misinterpreted my eDNS option or not? Every time we add a new feature, we complicate the outgoing uh, uh, machinery for the probing. And it adds on and on and on. There's one notable exception to that. You sometimes have orthogonal features. So for example, if you add a new record type, it doesn't bite anything else. As long as that record type just sits there and provides answers, you can add as many record types as you want, unless they're called DNAME, or unless they're called a name. So in general, stay away from features called something name, <laughs> like C name. Um, so the addition of features is not does not lead to a linear increase of complexity. Some individual features can lead to a doubling of the complexity of everything because now everything needs to be run twice. The net result, there is a push from the DNS standards community to evolve DNS because there's always something to fix. The implementation community says, bring it on, because we like doing that stuff. Um, the commercial operational community that actually has to answer the phone call at 3 a.m. when it breaks is not in this room. So let me do a small experiment. Who, who is on call for a multi-million DNS resolver installation? How about just who's on call 24-7 for operations? Who's on, who's on call 24-7? I'm impressed. There's more, more than I thought, except yeah. some of you work for me. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> so that's good. I don't work for you yet. Um, so the, 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 the point of view of the operational community would often say, please keep this simpler. And, and after a second iteration, they would say, can you still make it simpler? Um, but these, we do not hear these people because they, they, for a variety of reasons, they don't show up here. Um, a lot of features, therefore, end up being accepted and being implemented because of peer pressure. Everyone does it. And for now, this has been going pretty well. We have recovered from DNSSEC. Quality levels are good right now. But I get the feeling that if we go on and on and loading up this camel further, the number of people that get it will go down and the quality will go down again. And eventually, we don't dare to change anything anymore. So this is a, has been a long whine. Um, so um, is there, uh, do I have a proposal? I would recommend everyone, before we invent a new feature, we, we think long and hard at who wants this feature and who would benefit. That's one part. The other part, who bears the cost of this new feature? So for example, when we say, well, we would like to send a query that has an A and a quad A query in it in one go, it's obvious who benefits. The end user gets better latency. The costs are borne by name servers, resolvers, and I have to figure out if everyone understands that feature. Okay. The development community, including myself, should develop a little bit of spine and also say, look, you know how difficult this is. And, and, and it, I know it requires some practice because we, we think we can do everything, but it is legitimate to say, this feels like a lot of work and I worry about this. Um, and I would love for more operational people to be involved, the people that actually run this stuff and have a, could have told us in time that EDNS client subnet would, have, would be a disaster and that we also try to listen to them because, of course, I have to be honest, the commercial community always says that it's too difficult and that they don't want it. Yeah. So that is, is not going to be easy. Uh, there are some reasons why they don't show up and maybe we should work uh, on that and see if we can make it easier. With that, thank you for listening to my rant. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Bert. So
Oh, some comments. Some some comments. We have some time. Yep. Go ahead. Oh, Lord Wimerson. Thank you, Bert. You're not going like, to like my next comment, but you're basically <laughs> advocating DNS diet. We never do. <laughs> <laughs> in, in a sense, I'm, I'm advocating a DNS diet. Yes. I think that was the question. I think we should think long and hard whenever we add something new. Um, Mick Gieben uh, on Twitter today proposed that whenever you uh, write a new DNS RFC, you have to deprecate one. I agree with that. <laughs> then there's enough to, to choose from. So uh, I, I would indeed suggest putting it on a diet. And as somebody who has uh, worked hard at getting some of these big bumps in complexity into the standard, uh, I apologize. And I think uh, we, it's really time that we take a look at some of those and throw them out like NSEC3, just kill it. It doesn't work. It doesn't do what people think <laughs> it does. Um, uh, client subnet, it doesn't benefit anybody, but a few people who are willing to pay for it, but they should then pay everybody for it to implement it. But I don't like it. I don't think I would like it to die. There are D name. It's a, it was an okay idea, but nobody uses it. So maybe it's time to throw it out. I could go down the list. A name. It solves a problem. I, I, I see the reason for it. Yeah. So a, a good case in point is a name on the resolver side, which is where you can think real hard if the, 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 the benefits outweigh the costs. Yeah. Uh, I once asked a guy who had implemented a resolver what he would do differently if uh, he had to write it again. And the answer was, don't even think about it. <laughs> it's that complicated. That so fun. yes, we should make the protocol a little lighter. Okay. Or go to another one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, Matthijs Mekking, yeah, thanks uh, for the very uh, amusing uh, uh, presentation. Um, but also, you, I think you raise uh, a valid concerns. Uh, I, I do uh, indeed uh, not disagree with this. Uh, uh, some of your points. Uh, however, I'm first going to um, say that the 300,000 lines of co uh, uh, RFCs, there's a lot of boilerplate, so probably it's the half of it. But okay, still a lot. Um, I have so many things to say. I'm trying to be coherent here, but uh, well, you triggered a lot of, I don't know, reactions. Um, for example, you said ah, here's something like uh, NSEC3. Uh, we did NSEC3. Uh, it was complex, uh, and it is complex uh, because uh, uh, even for me, I read the RFC and I think, why are these things? And that's why uh, Mik. Given and I came up with just an informational document. I think it would be very valuable for the community to have more information document to exp to explain why for us certain responses are there, uh, why certain decisions were made. Uh, historic context is very hard to uh, grasp in uh, in uh, these uh, working groups. Um, let's see. Um, also, uh, I hear you saying, well, we come up with a, a, a standard and then we're going to implement that and uh, turns out to be very hard. I, must be the other way around, right? We're here to, to uh, make a standard to uh, get implemented, but before we're making it standard, there should be a reference implementation, it's ideally even more. Uh, maybe we should focus more on that uh, uh, workflow again. Uh, so, because if you do that, uh, you will have less of those unexpected results yet on the uh, uh, final slide. Uh, so, it shouldn't be, uh, I, I, implementers are keen to implement it, so it would be great if we could do that, have a reference implementation, don't throw it in production immediately, but uh, figure out those unexpected results before we write it down, or um, be, uh, maybe kill a feature because it makes it too hard. Um, Am I still coherent? I don't know. Okay. Um, that. You also had it up a uh, peer pressure. Uh, uh, I think Oliver touched on this a little bit. You don't have to implement everything. If you don't think it's a good idea, don't do it. Um, uh, yeah, if there's no money in it, don't do it. Uh, whatever. If you don't feel like it, if you're in a grumpy mood, don't do it. Um, At least by all means, don't do it uh, halfway. 
Don't, definitely yeah. don't do it halfway. Yeah. 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 Good point. <laughs> uh, and yeah, and maybe we should indeed fo focus on uh, 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 killing some things. Because uh, one thing I do agree with you is that uh, uh, if you introduce something new, there's a lot of uh, other things you have to take into account before, otherwise you may break stuff. But that also, if you do a reference implementation, you may be able to catch that. And I probably have much more, but I'll give the yeah. mic to someone else. I'm, I'm around all day. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Hi, uh, Alan's round. I would like to push back a little bit on your idea of putting DNS on a diet. Uh, I think the problems that you describe are real, but they are not only limited to DNS. This is something that we observe in the industry for all big pieces of software. I mean, I've worked with large vendors on operating system, routers, and I work with colleagues in other places similar. And essentially, we all have the same problems. We never deprecate any features, never happen. It's just too complex. You don't know what you're going to break if you deprecate something. You always implement something new because there's always a customer asking for this thing. And, but and I, I agree fully, but one of, I'm also been in, been in industry for a while. The really strange thing about our industry is that features are free. So you invent something new and everyone will rush to implement it. This does not happen when you build routers or switches. Because they say, ah, you want this, you're going to pay for it. And that provides a natural well, pushback. It depends on the size of a customer. They will pay in other ways then. Maybe. But the point, I, I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make here, we were talking about the price of success earlier on at the beginning of the working group. This is a price of success of a protocol. People want to use it. People have new ideas of using it. People will always come with new ideas on how to do things. So I think that the direction should not be to go on a diet and say no to new feature but the direction should be to have better processes for vendors to integrate and develop new features so that it's some streamlined and doesn't break things and there are better quality control, better processes for people that operate so that there are better tools to debug the network and to debug the implementation. No, that it, should be it, a better direction. I, th I think you're right. What we need is a balance between the push towards more and a push back towards it said, well, this maybe this is a bit too much, or do you really want this? Or if you want to get this feature, you will not get that feature. That kind of stuff. That's something that happens in the discussion with vendors of software, typically. You have a list of 25 features, and you can implement 10. Choose the 10, right? But the thing I'm saying, you sh this should come with a price tag, which is we have to find the processes it's, it's, associated it's, it's, with those features. Okay. I understand where you're coming from, but th that is not a landscape that we are in. Yeah. Oh, the open source nature makes this quite difficult, yeah. different. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. And but after, just, just, just briefly, after after you, I'm going to insert a comment from the for the mic from the Jab the Jamba room. Okay. But the is a thing. Thank you, Bert, for opening the kind of worms. Uh, you were talking about the standards, and we have to mention that standards are not the thing which is happening on the Y, right? We have like plenty of workarounds for all different crap which is out there. And so you was talking about the DNS on diet, so let's try this. Uh, CZNIC together with PowerDNS, ISC, and NLNet Labs, which, basic, which basically means the four main open source vendors of DNS resolvers are going to remove some eDNS workarounds starting next year. So we have some press releases about this out there already. So either catch me or Google for eDNS workaround removal. And let's see if the diet works. Thank you for bringing it up. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and John Clemson in the Java room says for the microphone, there's actually another issue with returning two record types for a single query, like A and quad A. See, the discussion of the original mail pair in RC8324, more due to Craig Partridge than to, to John. Um, and my personal note, I'll add that RFC8324 is actually worth reading as a complementary approach to what Bert has been discussing. Wait, there's a pretty good argument to be made that we're in a pretty deep hole here, people. Yep. Um, 8324 is very much worth reading. It's a very long uh, list of, of, of what is wrong and, and how it got to happen and what the fundamental forces are. And I, I have just a, a small riff on that RFC, actually. 
Um, David Lawrence, yeah, I, I don't think that there's actually anybody in the room that disagrees with the assertion that we're in a pretty deep hole and that it's not kind of nuts where we are. Uh, what has not been entirely clear to me, even with your closing slide, is what exactly is the call to action? I mean, you say, okay, go on a diet, you push back. Like, are, are we talking about a rechartering that specifies really what type of, you know, how to give the pushback that we need to push back? Are we going on a freeze that, like, don't do anymore? Um, and so that's the one thing I'd really like clarified is if we're headed towards a hum on something, what in the world are we humming on? Um, and then the other, I just want to point out a little history. Back in the day, we actually did like DNSSEC workshops. The uh, different uh, vendors got together and really worked hard to make sure things worked. And that's kind of fallen by the wayside. And to the extent that I'm, it takes time, it takes money. But you know, maybe we need a little bit more coordination. It's great, as Peter pointed out, that you know you're doing the the whole rollback the EDNS workarounds uh, issue. Um, but you know, maybe overall we just need more of that. Um, you know, how can implementers get together and, and have these workshops to identify what's good and what's bad. And then the one other historical note I wanted to observe was that um, Andrew was part of an effort a while ago to um, have this like omnibus reconciliation of 185 RFCs. And um, it, it went badly because it's a horrible, ugly, awful thing to try to do but it's also perhaps an important, necessary, something we need to do. <laughs> like if you, you know, look at the tax code or whatever, they, they reconcile it, they strike out the portions so you can just read the portions that you need to read. And, um, you know, like maybe it's time to finally do this harmonization and say as a working group, this is an important thing to do because as an implementer, you can't go through 185 um, different documents and trying to figure out how to implement the DNS correctly. Uh, and on that note, when the straw breaks the camel's back, you know because you have a paralyzed camel. How do you know when the DNS straw has broken the camel's back and that we... <laughs> oh. <laughs> but clearly we're not paralyzed and we're still moving forward or sideways or downward or whatever direction <laughs> we're moving in and, and to the extent that like you know, I know that the names consortium has been working on trying to figure out, like, are we moving towards different identifiers? Do we need a DNS v2? Like, perhaps we need to identify what metric is going to finally say, no, DNS is not something that's going to sustain us into the next century. So therefore, we are really going to be working on something better. Hi there, my name is Andrew Sullivan. And I'm also here to say, yeah, sure, I agree with you. Um, but, but um, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. But but the IAB a number of years ago wrote uh, a document about what makes a successful protocol. And one of the things that's in that document is this description of success and then wild success. And wild success sounds like a good thing. But if you read that document carefully, it warns you, wild success is not always what you want. Because you, you lose the ability to do things that you didn't want. Uh, to do with that protocol because people are now using it for stuff you didn't want. Um, and somebody, somebody I suspect in this room, published uh, a number of years ago, uh, you know, a t-shirt and a set of greeting cards and so on that you could get um, that was about, you know, how we hold these truths to be, you know, self-evident or whatever, um, uh, rough code consensus and running code and scribbled it all out and, you know, screw that, put it in the DNS. Um, <laughs> yep. And, and uh, I, I have a set of these, by the way, if, if people have lost them, I, I can mail them to you. Um, so um, I, I think that there's an important thing about this that we're overlooking. There are all these features that are here, but you know, if, if you think about, oh, I don't know, EPP or uh, another bespoke protocol like that, nobody is demanding weird, um, you know, stand on one foot and scratch your head um, uh, extensions to the, to the protocol the way, say, A name works. And the reason for that is because it's a bespoke protocol that is tightly bounded. But this is the database that everybody has on the internet and they're sure they're gonna be able to get to. It's the one. So we got a wild success problem. And if you wanna fix this, we've gotta come up with something that, that solves that problem in order to get people to stop jamming it into this thing. I don't know how to do that because I don't know how to tell the rest of the internet, nope, Nope, they're not using our protocol for that. They're going to do it anyway. I mean, my employer did it, right? That's that's what we do. And so I, it seems to me that if we don't, if we want to solve this kind of problem, 
then we need to come up with something else that is shiny enough that people will go and follow. It needs to be shiny enough that Warren will follow it, and then everybody else will go there. Um, yeah. and, uh, and, and I think that, that is, that's a serious problem. I'm prepared to like, you know, try to figure out how to get a boff going and so on to, to, to have that discussion. I, I have a suggestion, I think. I think I have, we have seen from PowerDNS that if you give something a RESTful interface, then the whole world says, this is shiny. So for the DNSSEC over HTTPS people, I would say, make it real shiny. Get all the people to innovate there. Well, I, so I, I would, I would um, say slightly further than that. You may be about to get what you want, right? And that is, it could be that, that the, the Doe working group is step one in the end of the DNS and that we'd be able to replace the under, um, um, the under layer after you've got this um, this top level interface. That's a possibility, but I think we ought to think about it rather than let it just happen. Thanks. Yeah. Just a small comment. I think actually where we are right now is right now, if we would stop typing now, we're not in the worst place. For example, the DNSSEC was really clever and then there are no obvious mistakes in there anymore. Um, so it's right now it's not the worst. Stan York and Andrew, I let you move ahead of me and you stole my joke because I was going to comment about Warren and his shirt, you know, which he frequently wears about just stick it in DNS. Yeah, well, you don't, you're not wearing that one today. I, I think <laughs> you've got something else, but okay, I can't tell. Uh, Bert, I, I just want to say thank you for coming and, and cataloging this in a, in a very humorous way on a very serious subject. I think the challenge to echo what what um, what Andrew said, though, is that we are a victim of the success. We are, you know, DNS is this, you know, database that everybody can access, and and you know, I'm in more places, and people are saying, well, yeah, we can just use DNS for that. I mean, look at how various different records have been used in ways that nobody ever thought they would be, in so many different ways. And I think one of the challenges we have is that it's nice to say we're going to slim down and, and get rid of some things, but at the same time, we are all very actively working here to go and add more features in. If we look at all the DNS privacy work, which is so excellent in so many ways, but it's going to add in you know, more aspects to that and more different ways to do that. So I don't know how we get there. I thank you for bringing this there. Um, I think, yeah, Andrew, you, know, you missed a word though, because you mentioned, or you mentioned JSON right or, or or rest api now if we also and we've got https we also need to throw in another word people starts with a b blockchain yes yeah. if we can do that then everything will be shiny and it will be awesome okay <laughs> so, so somebody just has to go put that together that to, okay but anyway. people this was a joke this yeah. was a joke it's a joke it's a joke it's a joke yes joke joke well no, there's somebody here so who's done. implementing that okay if we can get HTTPS, uh, blockchain, REST API, can you do all that? Okay, please try, all right. Anyway. <laughs> That's all text records. Anyway, I just wanna say, um, I think you're right though on the last part about it is a challenge to involve the operational community. We do need to do that. I, I would love to talk to people who've got ideas around how we can do more of that because that is something that we do need to to figure out a better way to bring more people here or, or not even bring them here, but to interact with them. You know, and to, and to help people understand. I gave a talk last year at the, um, at the ISC2 Security Congress, which was to a bunch of enterprise people about DNS and about DNS privacy and stuff. And a lot of those folks were suddenly like, whoa, wait, you're doing this DNS privacy stuff that's going to break the query, you know, the stuff we do to monitor queries on our local networks. You know, and so they were suddenly very unaware of all of the stuff that we're doing here. So it is the fact that we are making these changes that do have these broader impacts that do you know, make those changes on, those, on, the, on the curve that you have there. And uh, I, I'm not quite sure of the answer, but it is, it's a good topic that we all do need to be thinking yeah. about. Thank you. Well, do, <laughs> do it this way. <laughs> the Nordic uh, stand. Um, thank you, <laughs> Benno Overheim and Nelnet Labs. Uh, I really appreciate that you raised awareness in this room and uh, on, a, I, on an RFC diet, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but uh, it's more a personal observation here. Eh? The developer community should develop more spine. And um, so uh, Unbound was for some time known <laughs> to, be, to have some spine, given uh, the credits uh, on the DNS reactions with the cat. 
ping-ponging everything uh, he was said. People, you can have a look at it, at the DNS reactions. Um, but it was difficult, indeed, as you had on your previous slide, the interplay between standards, operators, and developers, oh, sorry, developers. Um, we, we did make some decisions and we thought it's not, well, we, we think it's not good to implement this. Uh, but to be fair, through the years, we, we did listen, of course, to the users. And you did make a decision, indeed, to, do you want to be relevant? Do you want to have this diversity in the DNS software? We implement these kind of features. And uh, so it's more a personal observation for me to share with you, not a question, not a remark, not an advice. But yeah, we, we think about it, we make our decisions, hopefully consciously, and we continue. So thank you again. Thank you. Give me a second, I have another comment from the Jabber room. Um, John Clanson again, given 8324 and the large number of things I learned from it and what I've learned from this presentation, the call to action might be, maybe we don't add more features until we have a consolidated document. We <laughs> <laughs> and we start treating every feature proposal as if it had real costs and risks, both now and in terms of what it might prevent doing in the future and really raise the requirement for justification of new ideas past near and we could and someone wants it. And Hi, this is Andre Suri at ISC. Um, speaking about growing some spine, I think we did grow some spine uh, with the EDNS workarounds. And um, um, I think this is like growing some spine is like both phase. Um, it's not only about accepting like or not accepting new features that come from ITF or, or other places and customers. But it's also about saying um, if you if you implement your own DNS server and you don't give a shit about what we need, then we will not talk to you. So we probably should um, because the, the list of the RFCs you, you have shown is, is quite long. But I think that uh, if we define as like the smallest minimum set that people should, well, no, not should, must, must. implement yeah. in their implementations for us to speak to them because it's causing development costs, it's causing operational costs to, to all, well, basically we are talking about the, the biggest four open source vendors here um, because it's, yeah, we, we don't get the big money from the big companies uh, mostly. Um, so, so if we can like uh, set up a, a sm smallest minimum set of the RFCs that the other people should implement if they think that the DNS is easy and they should implement their own DNS server in, in a couple of hours, um, then, uh, and, and put this, for example, as a best practice d document yeah. or something like this, uh, then it would probably help the, the whole ecosystem to, to not develop more broken DNS servers out in the yeah. internet. No, I think this is a wonderful idea, and, and I'd love to volunteer to help write the list of essential DNS RFCs. Uh, uh, also, to, to other people here, I, th I think that the, uh, well, the CZNIC, ISC, uh, LNET Labs, and PowerDNS are, are speaking all together, uh, even without these like ITFs and other venues. So, so we, we, we we are doing something to, to like coordinate what probably should not be accepted if there's something really weird coming our way. So we speak to speak with each other, and even though we are competitors in in the nature, we are also friends. Indeed, Thank and you. and not just the software vendors, but the third party external people that provide services as well, right? So yeah. we have to sort of yeah. factor them in too. Okay, sorry. Uh, Job Snyder's NTT Communications. I come from the BGP sewers, and from that perspective can perhaps uh, offer some insight. Uh, can you go back to the slide where you have people, operators, vendors? Uh, yes. So in comparison to the BGP working group in IETF, mm -hmm. the implementers have their own working group, IDR, and one of the strict requirements is that nothing can progress to RFC if there are not a number of proven interoperable implementations of whatever whatever is proposed. Uh, in IDR, it's two, but maybe DNS needs two affordative, two recursive, and two stop libraries. Like raise the bar, and that will maybe create the diets you're looking for. And 
This does impose significant cost on everybody involved because you might be spending hours on something that's not going to live. On the flip side, I do think that IDR, uh, compared to other ITF working groups, does produce quite quality products. And then funny enough, IDR is uh, kept in check by a different working group, namely Grow, in which the operators unite. And Grow functions as a sort of customary customer advisory board to IDR, and even is charted quite broadly to sometimes step in and say, no. Um, and this is a great feature, and then it upsets other working groups who are using BGP for things that we never imagined were possible. Uh, but, but so maybe we should start a new working group called DNS Op Ops. Um, but yeah, my two DNS comments... Real Ops. <laughs> uh, you said the developers need to grow a spine, maybe maybe the chart of the working group should make that more explicit so that there actually is venues or, or procedural uh, approaches for that type of feedback and, and try raising the bar. If, if RFCs have zero implementations, why are they RFCs? Yeah, well, thank you, Job. My name is Jim Tatia. Um, so first of all, uh, thanks for the presentation. It's very inspiring. And uh, uh, overall, I uh, agree with your point. Uh, DNS is getting more and more complicated. And uh, uh, we should be uh, careful about adding new features. And uh, on top of that, I'd like to um, make a comment as a, an implementer. Um, I'm an implementer of DNS. Uh, my day job, is, day job is to implement things on DNS. And uh, I think, uh, at least for me, um, I'm not the kind of person uh, favoring the challenge of doing complicated stuff. Because if I uh, have to implement very compli complicated feature, I know um, it, it will eventually trigger uh, some nasty error and I need to debug um, the issue. That, I, I don't like it. So uh, as a participant of the ITF, I generally uh, think about proposal as an implementer. And if I think uh, it's too complicated, I raise concern from that point of view. And actually, uh, in this working group, um, many uh, participants are also implementers. And uh, I often see that kind of fieldwork. So I guess. Uh, the situation is not as bad as you presented. And, uh, but again, still, I also see uh, the current situation is too complicated and uh, uh, we could uh, make it better. Uh, so I uh, definitely see uh, uh, some points to improve. Um, but uh, I would like to point out that the uh, implementers are probably not as bad as you might think. I think we are indeed blessed with very special kind of implementers that love saying yes. And maybe other working groups should get a few of ours. Uh, good point. Thank you. Hi, this is uh, Puneet from Google. So I'm new to DNS, and I'm going through some of the problems you described here because I'm new to DNS. Google's product has been around for a while, but I see these problems. So the thing I would say is I would second the suggestion, which is we should have implementations when we have RFCs. Without a reasonable implementation, it's hard to say how good the standard is. So that's something I think we should definitely focus on. Similarly, writing down a set of minimal RFCs, someone new to the protocol as an implementer, implementer that would be nice. So you know, here's the 20 you read instead of the 100 which are out there. And on that... Uh, same note, another thing, given the complexity of implementation, I think the community needs to do some work on having protocol validators which are available. So you should be able to say, here's my resolver, here's a validator which goes through, say, 1,000 points of DNS behavior, and you run it against it, should come back with, you passed this many, this many failed. We should be able to have that. If you're throwing this many resources at DNS, we should look at building compliance testing tools which everyone can use and have confidence that the stuff works. So I, I th the problem is those actually those tests exist. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is the people are not using them. I have a quick. Um, so we need to publicize them more in that case. Yeah. And, and, and punish the people not using them somehow. Uh, uh, one, one question for you, sir. Are you on the authoritative or the re resolver side? 
I'm on the resolver side, but I also know people who work on the authoritative right. side. Okay. Also, this Thank has you. been a, I think this has been a good use of our time and people are happy to keep discussing, but also I will be cutting the mic line in a minute or and so. Mr. Haberman. Well, or keep one minute because yep. we Mr. are almost out of time. You're the last one, Brian. So, uh, Lawrence. Okay. So, uh, I, I, historically, I follow up on uh, Yob's comments. It was the three eyes that independent interoperating implementations was a, it was a basic tenet of the ITF as a whole. And I'm wondering when that fell by the wayside for various groups and uh, would support actually bringing it back as a hard requirement before RFC publication. Uh, I would also, uh, on the DNS ops ops side, <laughs> uh, you know, again, historically, we had DNSX, and it's unclear, you know, I, I don't think this problem would have been really improved all that much. In theory, having protocol work done in DNS op would meant that ops considerations were taken into consideration, right? And to the extent that that's happened and made any difference, that's really been unclear. And uh, But it is kind of ironic that, you know, the whole reason that the protocol move from DNSX and that got closed was this idea that ops would be able to handle it and, mm -hmm. and here we are. And lastly, I will once again make a comment that I think I've made probably three IETFs in a row and observe that of all these RFCs that we have on standards track and uh, proposed standard, uh, we have done a really, really horrible job of turning any of them into actual standards as far as RFC nomenclature <coughs> is concerned. Um, and so perhaps we should make a concerted effort to actually start following up on which of those deserve to now be standards. Hi, Ron Frederick Surfing. Can you go back to the slide with the horrible C code? Um, so is there I, a book in the book? Or? Yeah. <laughs> No, 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 I'm not going to comment on the code because that's just plain horrible. Um, I used to work for, for a vendor, uh, a very small vendor that did smart card software. And if you're a very small vendor uh, and you have to interoperate with products that are made by really big vendors, then it is very natural to, even if you think it's not your mistake, to fix it. You are not a small vendor, you're big four, right? The big open source vendors. So rather than... I, I like your argument of saying, well, we need to grow some spine. I think you should grow some confidence because if you find this kind of crap, why do you feel you need to fix your product to interrupt with, with that? And <laughs> Because otherwise I'd get no, no money. No, I, I, I understand why you do it, um, but I, I think that the point Andre raised about having uh, a subset of our, a minimal subset of RFCs that everybody who does DNS is supposed to implement, and if they don't, then you don't have to interoperate with them, is, as, I mean, if that is on your um, public tender list, right, this, this public procurement thing, that you should comply with this RFC that says, if you don't do this, we don't have to interoperate with your product, that might go some way. It's just, it's just a thought, but you are the big four. You could sort of so one, 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 Capitalize one on thing I, I, I have pondered, and we pondered this uh, this morning, is instead of breaking non-compliant stuff, which is too painful uh, to contemplate, is giving them really bad service. <laughs> so if you break the RFC, we delay all your answers by like a thousand milliseconds. So it just sucks. Yeah, but I mean, that may be a lot easier to do. Uh, but if this if this stuff is in CPE equipment. And you are working for, for this operator who, who, who wants to use your product, wants to pay for support. Um, you should have a serious conversation about their procurement of CPE equipment. Yeah, I frequently have serious conversations about procurement. <laughs> they often involve drink. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you're, right. you're, you're completely right. You're completely right. But it's just the world is not cooperating. Hi, Bert. I'm Shane Kerr. Um, yeah, it's cool uh, presentation. Um, from my point of view, I've been thinking about this for a while, and I do think that as a DNS community, there seems to be a groundswell of support for some fundamental changes for dealing with this kind of big pile of shit that we're all dealing with every day. Um, I think that in order to progress beyond that, I think putting these measures in place about making it more difficult to get standards written or these kind of things, they can help, but I don't think they're going to address the fundamental problem, which is that we've got a protocol that's really, really old and has been pushed well past its uh, expected service life. Um, 
And I don't think we can just replace it, even if we have awesome JSON interfaces to do stuff. Um, Blockchain. I, I think that what we should be working to as a community is to try to find a way to evolve our protocol in ways that we can actually remove things, that we can do refactoring. I mean, imagine if you had a code base that you weren't allowed to change any of the old functions and just had to like layer on top of it, you'd end up with something that looked a bit like this, yeah. So. Um, that's where I think we should go, and I'm, I'm happy to work with people and try to move in that direction. So. Okay. Peter Koch, Dienik. First of all, hartelijk bedankt, or thank you for that presentation. Just for historical reference, I guess that was in San Diego, maybe in the year 2000, when uh, Randy Bush gave a presentation uh, overloading the saddlebags of an old horse. Now the horse evoluted in a, in a camel. Um, it is interesting to compare these two and, and uh, to look at what the problems were then and what the problems uh, what problems you identified today. I would be saddened, though, if the solution to the list of problems you uh, came up with would be yet another RFC that lists the list of the other other RFCs that are important, declaring the others not so important because then you just go, uh, or the community just would go back to square one, right? I think there's two issues here. One is purpose of standardization. We've often heard that, well, we need to standardize this because people are going to do this anyway. Yeah, please let them do that, but don't force people to implement things by giving it the ITF seal of approval. And, uh, and by the way, I, I sense that some of the solutions proposed were probably a bit incompatible, uh, incompatible with your analysis. It doesn't appear to me that we have too many RFCs that aren't implemented. It sounded more like we have too many RFCs that are actually yes. implemented because they add features that are brought forward by, by a small uh, or pretty much small use cases. The bigger issue though is one of architectural oversight and that is something that sounds nice in academic uh, environments and so on and so forth. Maybe it's hard in reality. But one of the problems is that, and we see that in the political as well in the technical space, too much is diverted to the identifier layer. There's too much done with the DNS that would belong elsewhere. Uh, and maybe the ship has sailed or the horse has left the barn or whatever the Im image in your favorite language is. But uh, this needs to be pushed up a, a level. Uh, just say no is, again, a very famous phrase, but doesn't always work. But it's, it's about standardization politics and not so much about listing more RFCs. Thank you. Try not to laugh when I say this, John Clemson. The ability to make a new feature work may be a necessary condition to, to its being a good idea, but it is not a sufficient one. I think that is close to the key point Bert and I have tried to make. So, so can you repeat the last part? I think that it is close to the key point Bert and I have tried to make. Yeah. Now I'm Mark Andrews. <laughs> Bind sends responses that break those, the, these servers, and the biggest problem is bad implementations. Yeah. Thanks. So, well, thank you so much for setting this out. Yeah. Apparently, this is and a worthwhile I, subject. So, so sorry, sorry. As someone who does operations on a daily basis, this is why I wanted you to bring these up because I think about this as well, right? And when we talk to our vendors, we talk to our software, we sort of, you know, we are op, DNS op, right? That is what we do. And we do have a lot of implementers in here. We do have a lot of operators in here, but we sometimes lose focus of that. And it's sort of good to sort of like, and and when, we, of course, when I put up the slide saying, we have so much work, we need to add a third chair, I kept thinking, and then Bert's gonna talk at the end about how much we have too much, we're adding too much stuff to the protocol, right? So I, it's a, that might solve a problem. you know, that, there's a dichotomy there, but I appreciate you doing this. And I do think, you know, we do think about this. The TCP folks have been trying to approach this by sort of redoing 793, by very slow piecemeal, but it's not sexy. It's like, no one gets any like, you know, lauded for that right it's just like it's the most ungrateful you know unappreciated work sort of thing and we kind of i've always sort of wondered is that what dns has to do at some level and nobody's going to want to do it right they'd rather go build something new because that's kind of cool and you know 
Everybody loves you sort of thing. So yeah, I appreciate that. I thank you for this. And I think people did enjoy this. And so thanks for sort of, sort of, uh, you know, humoring me, I guess, in some ways and humoring you as well. So thank you, Bert. It was my pleasure. So, yeah. Thank you. And Peter, yep. Sorry. Your boss talked too long. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. We do have another session on Thursday. The agenda is posted. Oh. Matthijs Mekking. Uh, uh, so good presentation. I felt that in the room a lot of people agreed with uh, some of the points, maybe more points and others. Uh, I was just wondering, what is now the follow-up action? Are we just leaving it here, or, or is there maybe some thoughts that we can resolve for some of the issues? I think it's stuff we just sort of think about for a little bit and maybe we start, you know, we come up with ideas, right? I've thought about this myself and it's just, like I said, it's... it's. I think I think what, it, what we're left with is that this conversation should inform our perspective as we consider the other, other work in front of the working group. But thank you for asking that. Okay, thanks. And we'll see the gang on Thursday. Blue sheets. Blue sheets if you haven't done them. So, oh, Andre's got them. Someday you'll want to say you were here when. Document it.